hooked and I've been gaming for like 29 years at this point, right? <laughs> and I have never came across something like this, like, Just, insane. Yeah. The day before's initial trailer was full of promise, a pitch that was equally ambitious as it was unlikely. For this reason, even at the early stages of existence, people were incredibly skeptical about what was being shown. And after all, why wouldn't they be? The day before announcement had arrived at possibly the worst time for a promising, albeit far-fetched trailer. Just a month prior, on December 10th, 2020, another game had launched after a decade of promises and trailers, painting a compelling picture, but delivering something that did not meet expectations. Cyberpunk 2077. With this game came a renewed criticism of the games industry's ability to present deceptive game footage years prior to the release of a product that seemed a million miles away from that expectation. This was not a new concept. Cyberpunk was just the latest and perhaps largest renewal of the conversation, becoming the most recent example of how deceptive a trailer could really be. Cyberpunk reminded people of the very real downgrade of graphics and gameplay that they'd seen for years, how a trailer was nothing more than a marketing tool, usually being polished for months to display a concept of a video game that may not currently exist in any meaningful way. Designed to be presented on massive stages such as the now dead but previously annual trade event called E3, shouting to the world, this is what our game is, what we hope it will be, or sometimes just an outright lie. So, given that people were already just burned with one of the largest game launches in history, the day before came at an unfortunate time for selling hype and promises. But what exactly was it about the day before that was causing raised eyebrows and suspicious glances upon immediate arrival? Well, to start with, the trailer was so heavily scripted and lacking in how any real human would play a video game that it almost comes off as a parody. The game screamed fake right from the jump out of fuel great man yeah i saw this initially like this actually this little bit here got me interested in the rest of this video because i was like god this is so fucking scripted like oh yeah so fucking it, scripted it, it really <laughs> harkens back to um the division yeah if you've yep. ever seen that trailer yeah you and, know, yeah and, he actually it, brings that up at one point so i think yeah over done because it's like oh we got hostels coming in it's like you know i talk with my friends like that when we're trying to larp yeah not when we're just like being like serious like that you know and he'll go i don't know if he goes into it but if you look at some of the trailers they're recreations yeah you know like there's like one trailer that's a shot by shot recreation in their game of black ops 2 yeah a yeah shot -by -shot there is yep he does Last touch on that Us. yeah so it's insane. It's it's literally insane. And like this went under the radar for years and it's just it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> but I just, okay. So the thing that like clued me off immediately with this, I was like, okay, kind of suspicious is how do you know the vehicle's running out of gas? Yeah, like, because they don't have any UI element there. Yeah, there's no HUD. There's no nothing on the screen. Like, <laughs> Yeah, the only thing that I could think of would be that they have it set like a sort of realistic thing where that the person driving is in first person and you have to look at the actual fuel gauge. Maybe. But then you, then you sort of get ripped out of that when you look down at the bottom left. You have a health meter, your hunger meter, your, yeah. your thirst meter. You, yeah. know, you have energy. So it's like, okay, well, that doesn't make sense because usually when you have elements like that, you sort of lean into the whole realism. You don't do this sort of half-assed UI element of like, we'll display some things, but other things we're going to leave for like – in game you're gonna have to find out yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so like that that was like you know it's like it's good you pointed that out because that's one of those sort of like weird juxtapositions yeah that from a game design standpoint like you don't really notice unless if you're focusing on it yeah but yeah no you're, you pointed it out really well <laughs> dreamed fake right from the jump running out of fuel great man awesome We'll look around here, I guess. Shall we split up? Yep. I'll find out what's in the skyscraper. Okay, and I'll look around here. Let's see what we have here. All right, all right, all right. I have found a great cowboy hat. Tell her everything's all right. 
and there aren't any more guns in the valley. Easy, cowboy. This is, of course, not the first oh time that company had used a yeah, it is so and bad. Bad. <laughs> segment during a trailer purely to convey how they expect their game to be played. In fact, the game that the day before was very clearly visually based upon had also done this just three years prior at E3. Hey, wait for me. Crap, they have a tank. Yep, I see him. Don't aggro him yet. Let me adjust my build. Got my crossbow and chem launcher. Now keep that talk of similarities between The Division 2 and The Day Before clear in your mind, as we will come back to this later. The rest of the trailer displays very little in the way of actual gameplay, and absolutely zero if you consider that this isn't how people play games. If you treated the trailer like a proof of concept for how they expected people to play, as a trailer that existed to give you a feeling of the game world but admittedly not actual gameplay footage, it would make slightly more sense as a concept. But what people were seeing was scripted interactions, absurd scenarios, and something more intangible. Something about the trailer just didn't feel right. The protagonist takes on three heavily armed players alone, without taking damage using just a sidearm, just scooting along within seconds as if nothing had happened, and at just the right moment, a horde of zombies appears as if from nowhere, flooding the lobby of a building despite the streets outside being absurdly quiet. The whole thing just looked and felt like one of those uncanny mobile game ads where the gameplay on display is utterly incomparable to what the real game looks like. The movements, the decisions, everything just screamed fake. This was not a developer controlling a character within the world, interacting with systems that already existed. This was something else entirely. Now in hindsight, the trailer seems incredibly stupid and lacking in substance. Which would make you question, why? Why were people so hyped about this? Why did people care? But the trailer did what it set out to do, and that is to convey an idea of what the game could be essentially to advertise what the players will be doing, finding things, fighting players, and surviving zombies. For this reason, it was a successful trailer. Though in truth, people should have been treating it like a concept artist drawing, and nothing more substantial. That being said, it's not how people treat trailers usually. They have expectations, rightfully so, that unless otherwise stated, a trailer represents something that does exist. This is not always the case, as many games have shown us over the years, if you thought movie trailers could massage a bad movie into a fantastic short trailer. By the way, I saw this and this was a fantastic like uh, comparison here with the movie because I do remember this. Like I remember seeing Suicide Squad and it looked like it was like a Joker movie. And literally what had happened was they showed all the Joker scenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was in it for like five minutes. <laughs> yeah. But I also, I also want to like roll it back here a, a second because like okay. Kira said about how um that it seems so fake. Yeah. And it it was, but when this was coming out, and this is important to know, the games industry was in a really really dire strait. Okay. Like AAA, like that's you know how they say that there's gonna be a second gaming crash. Yeah. This was at the start of that. So, like, you have, like, the big AAA games doubling, tripling down on these live service games. You know, the, the $70 game packed yeah. with the cash shop of, like, $40, $50 bundles. You know, indie games were sort of, like, burning out. Like, you yeah. had, like, this this overdone um thing with survival games so you had your for you have the forest you have the sons of the forest coming at like in yeah. development you know talked about you had um valheim you had all these games and it was like at a fever pitch where like it's kind of like when you get like the uh nigerian prince email yeah you know, like you see it full of like grammatical errors, but there's a part of you that like you know it's wrong, but you just want to have hope. Yeah, and that's you're kind hoping of what... that it's going to be a good fucking game, and that yeah, that they're they, not going to let they you don't down. Know English, right? Maybe they don't <laughs> yeah. know English. But yeah. This is real. Like a lot of gamers sort of like did those mental gymnastics because it's like, oh man, I really want this because Daisy wasn't doing good. Dean Hall left Bohemia Interactive. Daisy hadn't gotten updates, you know. Okay. There was nothing sort of like this on the market that blended these genres together yet. Yeah. So people were just like really hopeful and they really sort of like hooked into it. And that's when I said earlier about like how it was one of those things where like it was based on like the hope of like 
just wanting this blend that didn't exist yet and like this niche to yep. be fulfilled that people were so hopeful for. Yeah, it kind of strikes me as like, okay, so if I saw this, I would think that it's going to be like a resource management type game with a little bit of a first person shooter aspect to it, like maybe like a Fallout kind of type thing. Like trying to do that but zombie apocalypse style. Like that's yeah. that's what I would assume looking at this. Now like I'm one of those people that like I watch I never I don't think I've bought any game like on debut. Like genuinely, I don't think I've ever bought a game like when it premieres because I'd rather see like actual gameplay of it and like see people that know how to play the game and then they make a decision. I think the closest game probably of anything would be Lies of P. And that's just because yeah, that a lot of people awesome, were yeah. like, you know, this is freaking good. Like <laughs> immediately, like everybody's like, no, this is good. This is way undersold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's ironically one of those things where the, the developers of Lies of P Neo is did mobile games. So even the day before kind of hurt them. Okay. Because people were like, well, what experience do they have with console gaming? We remember fantastic. Okay. And they were like, holy shit. Like, no, they actually nailed it. Yeah. Like, these guys have talent. Yeah. We're like, that's one of those things that, like, really irritates me about Fantastic because they legitimately damaged some of these developers from breaking out of these industry, like, these little, like, sort of, like, mobile game things into the wider audience, right? Okay. And, like, you can just see, like, from the trailer, right? Like, this is my game nerd coming out but like like when Kira's <laughs> pointing out oh there's other players and they're fighting so that's giving you it's like okay so we're in this open world yeah we have fuel so like you said resource management now there's pvp so okay so now there's stakes because if we die they take our stuff so now there's that survival there's that high stakes that octane sort of like dopamine hit so it's like they're hitting yep. on all these things that gamers are now craving and that hasn't been done yet. Now, mind you, that you have to understand that this is like six years ago, five, six years ago. This hasn't been really done all that well yet. Okay. And the, so it feels like the the more you go into it, it's like game design by <laughs> like keyword uh, okay. Or buzzword. Okay. Like, okay, so, like, you, Kira will go into it, too, but it's like, you know, okay, so we have the open world, we have the PvP, we have, oh, okay, cool, like, full loot, you know, all yeah. this other stuff. But then you sort of break it down, and it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because you all go to the same city. So you're working together to rebuild civilization, leaving from the same city, but killing each other? Yeah. Like, there's no factions. Like, this should be set up as, like, two cities vying for control. Yeah, or at least two halves but, of a city. Yeah, you know, like, you know, trying to, like, survive, right? Yeah, like, like yeah. How you've even seen it, because you've played Fallout. Like, you even, like, you've played Fallout 3, right? Yep. So it's like, you know, like, the, the, the nuke quest. Yeah. Do you detonate it or not? You know, like, yeah. something like where you have that moral choice of, like, yeah. these cities sort of vying for this influence yep and it's no it's just you all stay at the same hub well that doesn't make sense if if yeah. we're working together why am i shooting you in the head and taking your stuff if it's going to go back to you well even i think of like cinema i think of like again you know uh um what is it dawn of the dead like the big the big premise of that whole movie is that there's a big like uh separation in class of like the uber rich people were in this one in this shard tower that's like uber safe and like they still had power and water and balls and like life was la di da fucking normal for them and then there's people on the outside that are like trying to fight to survive and then there's the zombie horde like you could literally have taken that thought process and applied it here yeah, and, like, The Walking Dead's another good example where you have, like, Negan yeah. and the Saviors and, like, the yeah, Governor and, yeah. like, all these different factions. Like, it was built for that, but they didn't do that. That's where, like, you know, you, when you start looking at it from that point where the lore doesn't match the game design and there's a lot of, like... Separation. Yeah, if you play <laughs> games, you'll know what I'm talking about where it's, like, it feels like AI or, like, designed by, like, 
disjointed, detached character. kind of thing. Yeah, it feels like an EA game where it's like, what are the kids into? <laughs> extraction <laughs> shooters. We gonna make this game like like the yeah. battlefield extraction shooter, like Firestorm, or like when yeah. they did the um the uh, other one uh, for Battlefield 2042. You know, where yeah. it just was like, this is clearly like your attempt to cash grab. Maybe even conveying a story that doesn't exist. Well, the games industry laughs about such restrictions. Instead of massaging footage and adding nothing extra, they can instead spend weeks or months creating a pixel-perfect fabrication without a single element existing in the real world. There is no constraints to this other than how much time, money and experience you have to put the trailer together. So aside from the trailer feeling and looking fake in terms of how it was portrayed, simple concepts do exist when judging games from a surface level perspective, and the day before was failing here. So what I'm talking about is that if a game is from an indie, small or unknown studio, you expect less in terms of graphical fidelity. This is due to high quality art and animations being a massive bottleneck for development, one that is only overcome with many talented artists working tirelessly for long periods of time, which of course means lots and lots of money. As a result, the day before trailer presented an immediate red flag with just how fantastic it looked. If you didn't know any better, this would look clearly like a very well-funded team with a large number of employees and experience. Either that, or it was a lie. Those are the most common explanations when you come face to face with this situation. So going back a little bit to talk about the Division comparison, people noticed that the forced cringe audio of the trailer was not the only thing similar between the day before and that game. The graphical style and world also looked strikingly familiar. So much so that the very first controversy surrounding the day before sprouted up from this similarity. Before any substantial information about the game existed, people took one look at the trailer, another look at where the developers were from, and decided that there was only one conclusion. Theft. This almost entirely came from the fact that Fantastic, the developer of the day before, was based in Russia. This was of course a stretch, with no evidence, after all, how could an unknown Russian developer get their hands on Ubisoft game assets and then brazenly parade them in front of the world during a game announcement? Still, the accusation quickly gained traction and even merit. And if there's one thing that is for sure, when people are suspicious about a video game, they will begin to analyse everything until they find what they're looking for. And so they did. Within the first few days of knowing the game existed, people noticed that the visual similarities between the games were simply smoke, but they had also found the fire. The Day Before logo, front and centre on all promotional material, was almost an exact replica of the Last of Us logo. In fact, when making videos about the day before, to make my thumbnails look as similar to the game's font as possible, I literally used a tutorial on how to recreate the Last of Us logo, and it looked almost identical. So at the bare minimum, the day before was being liberal with their usage of other people's work in their game. While they hadn't stolen anything per se, they were copying homework word for word, just in their own handwriting. So while there was no real theft of game assets, people had this feeling, and that feeling had led them to very real evidence of something being off with the game. Which just goes to show how easy it was from the initial trailer to tell something was going on here. And while this, of course, isn't proof that the game was some kind of elaborate scam, it was all the proof people needed to feel vindicated in their declaration that something was off about the game developer. So at this point, Fantastic could never win. The slate would never be wiped clean. Everything they said or did would be almost forensically scrutinized. A terrible position for a small game studio, but one that they had put themselves. They'd gained all the positives of winning the popularity contest, including the potential life-changing opportunity of such a massive audience patiently waiting to buy their game, but so too had they gained all the negatives. The only way they could truly win against the public's opinion here was to deliver the game that they'd shown. If it was good, all the negatives would quickly vanish, leaving them with a monumental indie success story, one that we've seen often. Instead, the coming weeks were full of additional discoveries, and the narrative was growing much quicker and much larger than even the game's hype. The start of this came from Fantastic's developer history, which they made no attempt to hide. 
Well, at least for now. The day before was not their first game. Simply googling the name or clicking the developer tag on Steam would take you to a list of products they'd already worked on previously. Games that they had abandoned very quickly after taking people's money. Now once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times, well, three times is a pattern. Fantastic's first game released into Steam Early Access in 2017, The Wild 8, a multiplayer survival game with a top-down view that was surprisingly well received. Unfortunately, within a few months of Early Access, Fantastic apparently sold the game to their publisher, Hype Train Digital. This was done while the game was still unfinished, essentially abandoning the game to somebody else's custody. The next one to be released was titled Dead Dozen, which released again in Early Access just one year after The Wild 8. This time, there was no positivity about the launch, instead a complete lack of attention before an even quicker kick out the nest of the awaiting pavement below. After that, they made a bone game by the name of Radiant One, which was a 40 minute long single player narrative game that launched a few dollars, and is the single bright spot in Fantastic's career of video game development. So at this stage, people had all the evidence they needed to light their torches and grab their pitchforks. The day before had nothing substantial present and a highly suspicious history, but of course, failure Okay, so quick question for you, because you know a little bit more about the gaming side of this stuff and everything else. So the early access, is that like a special program at all for game developers to get into? Like, uh, oh, I know some like developer companies like are very particular about who they let into certain programs. You have to have like a, uh, a pretty good reputation. Um, I'm, no, trying, to, I'm so... trying to think of what I'm trying to think of. I thought it was like maybe like Indiegogo or something like that. Yeah, like a Kickstarter. Or Kickstarter, yeah. Yeah, so, um, no, but Valve will scrutinize you. Okay. So, like I, I was saying how they broke Steam's toss. Yep. So, early access is designed for you to sell your game while it's still in active development pre-1.0. Okay. So, you're supposed to launch with a functional product... <laughs> that you believe you can finish. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that like it has to finish because there's tons of time where it's like we ran out of budget. We're sorry. We have to shut it down. You know. You 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 know. But Valve states, and this is important, why this got yanked. You're not supposed to sell it to fund your development. Okay. It's not a Kickstarter. Well, you're supposed to sell it and use the feedback you get from your early access to develop it further and it's supposed to be sort of more of like a financial contract of like you get money but it's not supposed to fund the development and this is where they break team terms of service where they said we can't finish it because we didn't sell enough to fund our development okay so the reason why i asked is like when i was watching this i noticed out of the four games that they talk about here well, technically, three games plus there's a uh, a DLC. Mobile game. Uh, yeah. So, like, uh, two of them were early access, but then the third game wasn't. So I didn't know if they were, like, kicked off the program and, like, they weren't allowed to come on until they finished something and that's what happened here, so... It very well could be. Okay. Because, like, Valve is... You have to look at Valve as more of, like, um, it, it does less curation... Okay. I mean, you can throw anything on there from like adult games down to like your your mobile puzzle ports. Okay. Right. They're they're more of like a kiosk for you to sell your thing, but they're they just will a marketplace. Yeah, but they will pull you if you do that, right? Okay. They'll let you on as long as you're accessing it. So it very well could be. Okay. That they got kicked off, or they were told that you know. Yeah. If you do this again or you abandon your product again, yeah, we will we'll, we'll pull you. That Radiant On was early access, the Wild 8 was early access, but then I noticed the the Dead Dozen wasn't. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, so maybe they kind of burned a bridge or if there was maybe some certain stipulations like you have to go through like you were saying like kickstarter i know like in order to be on certain like access programs like with them or indiegogo you have to like reach certain milestones otherwise they won't even let you do it they won't let you participate yeah. in the program yeah so basically like when you do it you do have to submit your thing to valve okay 
and you have to, and you have to prove that it's basically playable and you're still in development. Okay. So I mean, there there are some games that do really well, like um, Against the Storm, amazing roguelike city builder that I bought like four years ago, early access released perfect okay no issues it was updated and then you have things like this the day before where it's like a hype machine yeah right and i kind of almost feel like they were sort of led on because they had my tona's backing okay so it's like you know oh we have an early access game but we have a publisher okay we have funding you know, that's the important thing, the funding. We have funding. Oh, we'll let you on the platform. And then that, and then they sort of did that, like, almost bait and switch. Like, oh, yeah, we have to shut down. We, we didn't sell enough. We can't fund development. But hold up. I thought you had a publisher. Yeah. That's the point of a publisher is to fund it. So it also kind of makes me wonder if there was anything behind the scenes where my Tona was like, yeah. We're done. Um, yeah, <laughs> you just got to release it. We can't fund you anymore. And then they just dropped it. I yeah. was hoping for the best that the hype machine would sort of push Pay it off. through and they could. Yeah. And kind of do yeah. like a, a, a cyberpunk 2077 where they released it. It was a horrible game, but then they patched it into perfection kind of thing. Yeah. But not every game can have the no man's sky, the final fantasy yeah. 14, the cyberpunk sort of redemption story. Okay. You know, and I think that they were hoping for a no man's sky and they got the typical, the reality joke. of what happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. It isn't a crime, and if Fantastic ignored the mob, they could have probably just moved on. Instead, they decided, for the first time, though definitely not the last, to make things much, much worse. When Fantastic realized people were digging into their history, they simply wiped their YouTube channel clean. Where previously there existed videos of their long since abandoned games, now there was only one, the day before announcement trailer. Years of the YouTube channel remaining unchanged, but suddenly, now is when they decide to delete the things that people had just discovered. Coincidence as an explanation for any of this had long since lost credibility. Instead, every additional small action added to the growing pyre, ready for someone to strike a match and watch it all burn. There, this isn't the YouTube channel for this new game. This is the, just the developer's YouTube channel. So them removing their prior games that they worked on means they, they kind of don't want to highlight those things, you assume. And also interesting is if you go to the developer's website and you click on what games have you worked on, they don't list the Dead Dozen. So the Dead Dozen was by far the worst of the games that they've released so far. And they just are pretending on their website that they, don't even, they didn't even make it. <laughs> At this stage, just about everything that could publicly be discussed about the day before had been stripped naked and paraded through the streets. And so the internet moved on with their lives. Until March of 2021, where Mytona, the publishing company above Fantastic, who is the game developer, reached out to press outlets and content creators, stating that there was a live stream coming soon that would show something exciting. There was little to no details, only that on March 31st at 9 PST, it was showtime. The day before this live stream was due to begin, Mytona, who were working closely with IGN to broadcast this announcement, declared that the event would be moved back one week until April 6th. On that day, fans appeared in the thousands to discover what this exciting announcement could possibly be. Perhaps a beta test, something to address the criticism, an answer to any of the many questions people had regarding the shady nature of the developer. What they found instead was simply a logo on the screen and some music in the background. This continued for two hours before the fantastic Twitter account posted a message addressing what they described as technical issues. These so-called technical issues continued for seven more hours, making their exciting announcement stream nine hours of music and a logo. It was at hour nine that Fantastic took down the stream and posted again on Twitter, stating that the event was now postponed until further notice. On April 9th, just a few days later, they were back live on the IGN channel. This time, they presented a 13-minute gameplay trailer that showed an incredible number of features that were absent from the initial reveal. It starts out with off-roading a vehicle through a muddy area, moves on to a closer display of the looting and shooting mechanics at a gas station, before heading to a farmhouse showing destructible terrain, teasing a PvP event Notice with how they players, have and the trailer ends with the- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, just like the little things like that, like... Yeah, like, I, I would say off of this trailer, I'd be intrigued in this game, like, it actually looks pretty decent. If you want a game like this, and to anyone in the audience, check out on steam it's called once human okay it is more akin to rust rather than this but it has like elements of like a horror like the secret world which is one of my favorite mmos that sadly funcom dropped the ball on um it has survival things and it's uh 
a sort of like it's a live servicey game, so you're gonna get updates every six weeks. Oh, it's nice. basically the way I describe it is, it is what the day before was should have been trying trying to market to you, but it's real. <laughs> and and the shooting mechanics are solid the survival mechanics are solid you know it's not like other games where it's like oh you're thirsty every 30 seconds so you're like yeah. stuck in this like gameplay yeah. loop of like eating and drinking yeah like it is a solid game if you were intrigued by this and one sort of more of a horror sort of um style of this game once human on steam it's free to play you know comes actually ironically from a developer that has worked on this is their first major game huh so like it's one of those things so where it's, it's like, literally don't... like a, a show up of what they could have been yeah yeah and you have elements of like games that you can tell they've played like control it has sort of like the telekinetic sort of thing you know it has like um death stranding style where you have like a backpack but you carry along these little dudes called deviants that are like scps but they give you bonuses oh nice so i have like this little robot guy that goes out and does mining for me that just brings back ore. there's one that does cooking for you called cookasaurus like <laughs> like like okay. it, it, it is what the day before should have been so if you're okay. looking for a game like that once human on steam it's free to play it's it's really good actually sweet cool through a muddy area moves on to a closer display of the looting and shooting mechanics at a gas station before heading to a farmhouse showing destructible terrain, teasing a PvP event with heavily armed players, and the trailer ends with the players running into a bunker, closing the door behind them and fading to black. During this trailer, a keen eye can see a large number of small features that could otherwise be ignored, but will become vitally important to the story a little later when we compare the trailer now to what happened in the end. Things such as mud and water splashing up the vehicle, the suspension bouncing as the 4x4 moves over rough, uneven terrain, the breaking of the farmer's fence before exiting the vehicle, running through wheat that moves with the character, the opening and closing of doors, things that add ambience and depth to a game world that do require many dev hours to perfect, though seeming small on surface level. All in all, the trailer did a much better job of showing the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay of the day before in a slightly less scripted manner. Still, everything people had discovered about the developer thus far didn't suddenly go away. As a result, the top comments on the new trailer were all either jokes or criticisms of what was shown, mostly relating to the presentation style, which was becoming a running theme with the developer. They'd put someone in charge of controlling the main protagonist, who had terrible aim, moved incredibly slowly, and with a stiff, almost robotic action, but most importantly, the trailer still just fell off. All in all, it did nothing to convince those who were now of the opinion the game was a scam, but it did drive a massive number of eyeballs and a growing interest in the day before, whether for the actual game or just for the drama. The biggest and likely most overlooked issue with trailer's release is the way that it was delivered. Now that people knew it was a simple 13 minute video to be shown during the initial date of March 31st, it was worrying to say the least. The delay to the release date could be forgiven, as sometimes a few finishing touches or last minute issues could cause a brief delay. But when the new date arrived on April 6th and fans were left watching a logo for 9 hours, that was simply a head scratcher. After all, showing a video on a live stream is something that an actual child could operate, and this was being presented by IGN, one of the largest video game outlets on the planet with a simple task that they had extensive experience doing. The only real explanation here was that Fantastic had somehow messed up the most basic of tasks. Now this simple mishap seems tiny, but it showed that even the very basic handling of the day before's public perception was simply a bridge too far for Fantastic. They were taking the once in a lifetime opportunity of having access to a small studio's dream, a massive audience with interest in their game, and fumbling it every step of the way. While this is, in the grand scheme, small details, it signaled to everyone paying attention that the road to release was going to be bumpier than the trailer's off-roading experience. So before we continue, it's important to take a temperature check of where the community was at with the day before, as I've so far only presented the overwhelmingly negative and critical side. There was, in truth, two sides to this story the whole time. One group was that of the skeptics, combing through every frame of every trailer, breaking down every detail imaginable, and labelling the game as fake, the developers as scammers, and the whole situation as ridiculous. On the other hand, there was a group of people that ranged from the wait and see gamers who refused to join in the witch hunt, as well as people on the other end of the spectrum who took it upon themselves to defend it against the overwhelming criticism and what they labelled as hate from a mainstream bandwagon of angry gamers. Basically, this could be summarised as the old haters versus fanboys argument, though really, most people fell closer to the middle of this spectrum. One very interesting question was being asked by the people defending the day before, which needs to be discussed in this video in order to progress the story. This question was twofold. Firstly, how could the game be fake if there were multiple trailers showing gameplay? Secondly, and most importantly, Fantastic and the Day Before hadn't taken a single cent from the public, so what was in it for them? 
Effectively, why and how could this be a scam as so many people adamantly believe? If nothing was gained, what would be the point of it all? Now in response to the first point regarding gameplay on display, this could be answered very easily. It is commonly known that it's possible to build what is referred to as a vertical slice of a game and show features that work only in a very specific way, in a very specific area, without handling any of the difficult parts of development, giving off an incredibly polished and substantial view of a game that doesn't really exist beyond that small example. Add in things like post-processing, interface elements after the fact, and the nature of pre-recorded footage being easy to orchestrate, and that gives you the answer. This is why hype trailers can be considered a waste of real development resources and serve only as marketing material to drive potential future sales, because much of what is built in a trailer is work that might never be usable in the real game environment. Of course, this is not a rule of thumb. Gameplay trailers do exist, and teaser trailers are usually labeled as such, but it is possible. And in terms of the money question, well, they were right. They were absolutely correct on that one. No one had lost money from the day before. Not a penny had changed hands. There were no pre-orders, no crowdfunding, nothing. So what could Fantastic possibly be gaining by lying about or misrepresenting its existence or substance? At the time, people speculated that the answer to this could be the scam happening to investors and partners like Nvidia and not the public, which is plausible. It was never ruled out. But the real answer came with Fantastic's next move. Just a few months later, in October 2021, all became increasingly clear. Prepare to stream something amazing after the event. What does that mean? Is something coming today, guys? You've just seen some new videos from the day before, and you know the release date. We're looking forward to delivering the day before for you. And now we have something more. Our second inner team at Fantastic has been working on something super fun over the year. We're happy to show you our new game, Prop Night. Join Prop Night open beta right after the event. This was we Fantastic. Should be buried in that forest. On the hype the day. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you have a little hate for them. Well, because this is one of those things where it's like, I, I really, really dislike <laughs> anyone who, like, thrives off of hope. This would have been, like, screaming at me bait and switch at the moment. Yeah, and that's exactly why I, I dislike them so much. You know, it, as simple, as silly as it sounds, like, you know, gaming has gotten me through some of the worst shit in my life. Yeah. and And, like... Knowing that someone out there is going through something difficult, knowing that, oh, I can't wait for this game, I'm so excited. You could escape, I'm... yeah. Yeah, and then, oh, by the way, here's our other shitty 1v4. Like, we're, we're following the trend of Dead by Daylight now. Yeah, yeah. Because like... we can't shove it into this game, so we made another game to shove it into. Here's something that stood out to me, like, and, and that was nuts to me watching this for a game that came out looking as unfinished as it did was watching this Not part here film. gameplay trailers do exist like the vehicles the actually trailer. making the tracks in such. the mud but it... and like just the i i get like what he was saying about some of the, like the polishing and stuff you could do post-production and all that but like yeah. this actually looked pretty good right here like even if it's just like an environmental horror kind of thing like they're they they kind of, like, this This looks insane. This looks pretty on par with a lot of, like, driving sims that I've seen. Yeah, and see, that is one of those things that really raised a red flag to me. Because, okay. Because, like, like Kira said earlier, it takes a lot of finance and talent to do that. So, you really have to know programmers that know their shit to program that. Yeah. To make it work. And I was sitting there thinking, this doesn't feel right. Because <laughs> if you look at a lot of successful indie games, like Stardew Valley, um, Signalis is another good one. They will use, like, pixel art or lower poly art. Yeah. Because financially, it's beneficial. It's not difficult, but also resource-wise. It doesn't tax systems as hard. Okay. So, like, if you look at Stardew Valley, and this is a, a theory that I know some people, like, disagree with me on, but the reason it was so successful was because it was so low requirements. You could put it on everything. The Switch, the Xbox, the PlayStation, PC. The portability Even of like, it. Eight years ago, like, if you have a PC from a decade ago, you more than likely can run Stardew Valley. It opens up to this wide customer base yeah and it is stylized it's good it's effective it's not a it doesn't put a financial strain on you that the amount of 
finance you need for that ray tracing with the light, for that mud, for those tracks, to program the physics. Financially, that is a massive undertaking, and I'm supposed to buy these two brothers in this random forest somewhere in the middle of <laughs> Russia, Russia. Yeah. Have, have the budget <laughs> for that after we've seen quote-unquote gameplay. Well, there's going to be another subject that's going to come up that uh, when we get to it, I'm going to ask you about it. And I think it relates to some of this. And so, but I want to ask. So once we get there. Turn okay. Fortnite open beta right after the event. This was Fantastic's first move to cash in on the hype that the day before generated. They had millions of eyeballs on their every move, mostly for negative reasons, and they were now going to leverage that tension for financial gain. They had baited their audience, haters, fanboys, and everyone in between to watch an announcement expecting a playable version of the game that they were excited for. This was orchestrated carefully and done in a way that does not happen by accident. Admittedly, it was a smart move, but one that again, in retrospect, showed that Fantastic were behaving incredibly suspect. After all, everything they'd shown was difficult to believe, lacking new substance, and delayed. Not only that, but communication was insufficient, they'd already failed to address any of the questions or concerns of the public, and they'd now baited their whole community, as well as journalists, content creators, and all to push out a product no one had asked for and wasn't even related to what people were interested in seeing. They were essentially trading any chance to gain the public's trust in the long term, something they'd already lost, for a possible short-term financial gain, and for a brief moment, it looked like it might just pay off. Prop Night, their announced game, saw a surge of players that had it not been for the eyeballs generated with this tactic would have been unlikely to otherwise exist. Unfortunately for Fantastic, the success was as short-lived as the game was mediocre. Again, Fantastic had, by luck or manoeuvring, put themselves into a winning position and then tripped over their own feet just before the finish line. Had Prop Night been a compelling, innovative, or at least different enough flavoured drink to the Pepsi and Cola of games like Dead by Daylight, then this could have been a masterful gambit. Instead, it was lacking in any meaningful improvement or difference from its peers, and destined for a sharp decline before a slow march to the halls of dead multiplayer games. Now in retrospect, people were focused more on the gameplay trailer and the issues they had found with it than on Fantastic's inability to handle a single public interaction without either pure incompetence or failed sleight of hand. This event was advertised deceptively for the day before, but contained barely three minutes of footage and existed purely to push Prop Night instead. The real issue wasn't with the substance of what they'd shown or done, it was with the intention. But there was one redeeming quality of the event. They finally announced when the game would launch, just eight months away on June 21st, 2022. Unfortunately, we soon come to find out this was never a real date to anticipate. But first, we come to the first lengthy time skip in the day before Saga. Unlike previous short lulls in the story that were full of discovery about the studio's history, analysis of recently released trailers or comparisons and similarities between assets and logos of other products, there was nothing really left to discuss. The only new footage that became available was part of an Nvidia partnership, which showed very little more than what we'd already seen. Almost nobody paid attention to this, nor was it meaningful in any way. The next big news came in early May 2022, just one month prior to the game's announced release date. And as you would have guessed if you paid attention to the runtime of this video, or if you're familiar with Orwood's story, this was a hefty delay to the game's release. The first in what would go on to become a habit of game delays. While before they had delayed trailers and other announcements, this was the first sign that the actual game development was not going to plan, certainly not as well as the trailers attempted to portray. But as with most of the story to date, Fantastic had put themselves in a good position, even with this bad news. You see, Unreal Engine 5 had just been released a month prior in April of 2022. This was making a massive buzz in the gaming industry. Their showcase was now one of the most widely discussed developments of a game engine in recent Okay, so this is going to bring me to one of my first big questions to ask you and maybe the chat, you know, they can weigh in here definitely. How big of a deal would something like this be to you guys? Like enough that you would be okay with having a game delayed? Um, in order to make use it, of it. It's hard to say because Unreal 5 is gorgeous. Yeah. Like, like that, like that, like, the yeah, I've seen some, stuff, I've seen some beautiful, yeah, I've seen some beautiful modeling and stuff come out of it that like, even outside of gaming, I've seen Unreal 5 used in a bunch of different ways. Well, you remember the, the Keanu Reeves, um, Matrix thing right yeah that i mean it is undeniably gorgeous for me it's hard for me to say that unreal 5 wouldn't sell me right you have to sell me on the gameplay so it depends heavily if they were doing it no because you haven't sold me on the gameplay Okay. And that you've effectively made the game. But if I was already hyped for your game and you're like, I'm delay we're delaying it from 
this to put it into Unreal 5, and I already have trust in you and faith in you, that does hype me up. But it 100% depends on the publisher's reputation or the developer's reputation yeah. and whether or not they have something to sell me that I'm interested in. Like, it's Unreal 5, to me, isn't a make or break. It's like, oh, we, we're giving you really good web dicing on your cake. Okay, yeah. but I need the cake. Because, like, okay, to give you the last time I cared about this shit, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. And so it wouldn't be, like, the Unreal Engine. It would be, like, uh, uh, okay, I was a big Battlefield 3 player. And so, like, with the Frostbite engines and stuff like that and the destructive terrain and things like that, that was really, like, a big deal. It was kind of, like, a big leap forward in gaming. Enough that I remember, like, people, like... It did it didn't matter when that when Battlefield 3 would have come out because it was using such a new process. Like a, a war game where you're actually able to destroy buildings and everything else, and it's not just like the block chunk like fall apart, like you can tell where it's gonna come apart stuff. Like it felt more organic destruction. And real. Yeah, yeah. Well see, and, and that's interesting that you bring that up. Okay. Because from your perspective, yes, it is. But we're not talking about like Unreal to Frostbite. We're talking about Frostbite 2 to Frostbite 3. Yeah. Yeah. And like that's where like I'm like, if that's the difference we're talking about here, I'm like, God, I, I don't know. I mean, because from what I've seen with even like some Unreal 4 stuff, because again, okay, so uh, another kind of off the wall thing about me. I watch a lot of like Maritime and like other different um, like kind of docu-series type stuff like Maritime Accidents and things like that. It just interests the hell out of me. And they use a lot of uh, like brick and mortar um, and a couple other different channels use like Unreal Engine like generated graphics when they're like actually showing like what happened like with uh, El Fargo is like one of, one of my favorite fucking stories because these guys literally drove a fucking... Uh, container ship into a category five hurricane, and <laughs> that, you might have to send me that offline because that sounds insane. Oh, it was at, unfortunately 36 souls were lost, but it's like one of the most insane things you could ever think of. Like, these guys that's, literally that's missed big. like a cat two hurricane early in the sea, like literally weeks before, and then drove their ship into a category four hurricane and were never seen from again. And it wasn't like, luck. it wasn't even like you're driving like a well-maintained, like, um, like Mercedes of fucking vehicles, like a tank into a fucking hurricane. Right. Yeah. This was like a rusted bucket. That, <laughs> that, oh God, it was a glorified dinghy. <laughs> that had no chance. And these guys, like, it's insane. There's a lot of backstory on it and everything else. Like the actual company that ran the El Fargo actually ended up suing the people that were uh, crewmates, the families because of like maritime law and stuff. It gets really insane. Um, Definitely send that to me. Cause that seems like something that's like so insane. Yeah. That's right up my alley. Yeah. If you guys, if you guys want to see like what I'm talking about here, I'll show you. It's called brick and mortar. And there's another one that's uh, more maritime disasters, but the Alfaro this like he actually uses in there um he uses modeling so he does all the charting and everything but like when it gets into activities like here you can kind of see he's actually using Un unreal engine modeling for showing what's going on and showing like what's happening externally on the ship because like all of this is obviously stuff that like you couldn't get now because the one ship is gone but it's it's pretty cool stuff to watch. Like, here. We've made a green quote. This was every day in Alaska. Uh, I thought it was one of the points, like, where it showed, like, he'll actually show, like, how they break apart, how they sink, like, what likely happened. Like, this gets into, like, some real technical shit, but I love it. <laughs> but, yeah, he actually does use quite a bit of, like, Unreal Engine and stuff. Um, the other one that was insane that was really funny to watch was, or not funny, but, uh, sad, it's a tragic thing, is, what is it, like, two years ago, uh, was the sinking of the Bounty, 
Okay, so if you guys have ever heard of the Disney movie, The Mutiny on the Bounty, it's done in the 50s, okay? Like, this is yeah. old, genuine Disney stuff. So, uh, uh, the bounty. So, like, this, it's a legit, like, sailing ship. Like, it was a tall rig. And so, like, there, this ship is the only ship that three times it has met its fate. Okay, so there's the original bounty and what happened with the original bounty and her crew and everything back in like the 1700s, right? So Disney creates this ship and for this ship, like they do almost a 100% accurate recreation of the ship and uh, something happens with it. At one point it sinks and then the last time they bring it back, they refloat the ship, it gets restored and everything. And then uh, just a couple years ago, it sinks again in a hur in Hurricane Sandy. So this ship, this namesake ship, the mutiny. There's the original bounty story, and then the ship from the movie, sh the movie ship, has sank twice. So it's basically cursed. <laughs> yeah. Is what I'm hearing. <laughs> like it's basically cursed. Yeah, but like uh, Ocean Liner Designs is another one that uses a lot of Unreal Engine stuff. But a lot of these channels, they, they actually do use a lot of this stuff, which is kind of funny. So, like, this is how I know. There you go. Like, you can kind of see there, like, some of the Unreal Engine and everything else, like, they actually replicate it. Yeah. And so, and it's... I, I don't know if I would, like, I don't know if I, as, like, a casual gamer, could really tell you the difference between Unreal 4 and Unreal 5. Yeah. I mean, it, the ray tracing, the lighting, um... I'm sure that they were probably more ecstatic because, like, the tools, from what I understand, from a design standpoint, are better. Okay. And since it's the latest version, it's going to get, obviously, more updates, okay. right? So, I, I can see them being excited for it, but, like, as a, as a consumer, it if you don't have... I'm not going to buy a game because it's on Unreal 5. Okay. Like, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Like, So it's like not like Frostbite. a driving factor like Frostbite was. No, no. Because, like, Unreal 5, it's pretty... It could probably handle physics really a lot better and more, like, computationalized because of the okay. way the um, the tools work and stuff. But I, 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 there's not something in me that says, like, I really want this over Unreal 4. Now, the now, other thing... Unreal 3. That... Unreal 3 had a lot of issues, but... The other thing that I'll say is I'm also a console gamer moved to PC recently, like within the past couple of years. So like I, I couldn't tell you a lot of niche things was like, did you have to have a lot more upgraded technology to run like Unreal 5? Like, would you have to have like an RTX gen card and stuff like that? It, Yeah, because um, not because of the engine, but because of what it will allow people to do with yeah. it. It's sort of like... um. It's hard for me to describe it, okay. but like no, that's fair. The way that's that fair. It, the way that it opens up things, like with ray tracing, like the it efficiency makes ray of it and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you'll need it not because of Unreal, but because it is more easy to get like things like ray tracing. You're gonna need it because now people are gonna start putting ray tracing in as like a common feature, whereas okay. it used to be like when Cyberpunk came out, like this was... is like the bougie yeah. sort of like if you're rich you can do it. But now like my my forty sixty that I paid like two ninety for yep. on sale has ray tracing. So now it's just a basic feature. So it's sort of one of those sort of like leaps in sort of generational tech that you are going to have to upgrade. Okay. But it's not like this massive like it doesn't it won't sell you. If you like what you have and you'll be you just fine. Look, okay. Yeah, if you want it to look better, Unreal 5 will excite you, but it's not a selling point. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. It's in history. Fantastic's video game had little to no footage shown for a while, had a massive question mark hanging over its head, was clearly not ready to launch, but luckily for them, they'd just been saved from an optic nightmare by the fortunate release of this game engine update. Unreal Engine 5 had arrived just in time to give them the perfect excuse to push back their game. Not only would it give them time to work on things that clearly wasn't ready, but most people were immediately on their side. Where they would usually have heavily criticised such a lengthy delay, people were apparently happy to wait, so long as the result was exactly what they wanted, a next generation revolutionary open world zombie survival MMO. And people were so excited about Unreal Engine 5, how could you not want this game to have that? So the wait began, as the delay took the game into 2023, March 1st specifically, just over two years after the game was first announced. 
For the next few months, the Day Before Saga should have been quiet. There was no footage to speak of, no news, nothing related to the game at all. But in true fantastic fashion, there was a discovery that sparked a new inferno of criticism that had previously died down to embers. Fantastic had released a video, as well as a section of their website, which described what they referred to as volunteers. Specifically, how they used volunteers and how you too could become a volunteer. The description was a real head-scratcher. Fantastic's culture is based on volunteering. Every single member of the company is in fact a volunteer. Which makes no sense, since a volunteer is, by the very definition of the word, someone who freely gives their time or labour, and therefore paid employees of the company could not be a volunteer. This led to common sense interpretation that Fantastic were using the idea of even full-time employees being volunteers as a way to obfuscate the fact that they had a substantial reliance on unpaid labor within their business. Perhaps even as a way Basically to shield an from army of and muddy the waters okay. of just who is a volunteer and what are they doing in regards to the game development. When people discovered this, it became another avenue of attack for critics who were rightfully discussing the issues with using unpaid labor for things that clearly should be paid. Just another arrow in the quiver of doubt, which was now packed tighter than Fantastic's staff budget. In response, Fantastic tried to style it out, stating volunteers only worked on things such as localization, a job that would be expected to be compensated financially, as if this would change the public backlash that was clearly not based on this single topic, but the culmination of events thus far. Not just that, but community moderation was also left up to these so-called volunteers, a decision which very soon would come back to bite them, but not before Fantastic gave another answer as to an earlier question. What were they gaining from lying about a game that didn't really exist? Where was the scam? Well, fast forward to January 2023, YouTuber Big Fry posted a video discussing yet another incredibly suspicious aspect of Fantastic. On January 3rd, 2023, a video titled Life at Fantastic appeared on their YouTube channel. It has since been deleted, like much of Fantastic's history, but they did initially advertise it on their Twitter as a, quote, huge premiere. The significance here is that they were, again, leveraging fans of the day before to tune in for what was advertised as a look behind the curtain at the game's development. Perhaps they were going to answer the question of whether or not the game was real which was now considered naive to even ask, as almost all public discourse was that the game was a scam, no further elaboration required. This is not what people got. Instead, the video was yet another barely concealed product placement, another deliberate bait and switch, this time for an app that Fantastic had created, an almost identical situation to the previous uh. one, cashing in any of their remaining credibility for eyes on another product, trying in any way they could to profit from a popularity that they seemed constantly surprised I'm by. I'm still waiting for us to get to, to the point where I'm going to ask about something. ...was discovered to be owned by Fantastic. The video even included a link that said, Download Continent, as well as a pinned comment with the same, making it very clear as to why this video existed in the first place. Jolly is a vehicle to sell an app, not to lift the veil on the day before. And again, almost as if history was repeating itself, as soon as the public called them out on this fact, instead of addressing what had happened or clarifying on their intentions, they simply deleted the links, pretending like nothing had happened, just like they did when they deleted their YouTube videos. People then pointed out the suspicious activity, asking why the links were deleted, and Fantastic's next move was to simply turn off the ability to comment on the video, <laughs> as if this would make everyone forget what they'd just seen with their own eyes. Now, if you thought this story was a wild ride so far, buckle up, because the rest of 2023 is the most ridiculous thrill ride of gaming incompetence, lies, and stupidity that, that you will likely ever see. When the day before yeah, promised that the fair. game would be unique, they didn't lie. No game in the history of Steam has ever achieved. Yeah. So go ahead. So basically, you have the volunteers, which are will pay you an exposure. So you have people doing localization and translation work for free, so you can throw it on your resume and will pay you in free keys. That they expect you to make your money by selling on like third-party sites like CD Keys or G2A. Yeah. But that's gross because it's like, here's your paycheck. Now put in the effort to, to get it, <laughs> you know, and, and then, and then the fact that they have a, this budget, right. And this, the day before has been delayed. Like, I think like three times by now, okay. we can't get the game out, but we had the money and the manpower to, to create, create a, two more games. Well, an app in a game. Well, yeah, that we created this proprietary Met, like internal scheduling software yeah that it was so good we can't help but now sell it yeah like like you know like we created our own proprietary meeting thing that like google calendars does the function for <laughs> you can literally use google <laughs> for this but they just had to like throw their money into it because they just they, they're, they're just so good and it was such a good thing that that Google can't compare. So yeah. we're going to sell it to you now. <laughs> By the way, we delayed our game again. 
Like, like we delayed our game, guys. but here, here, you can use this probably, maybe, kind of, sorta. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, like, but hey, you know, I know you were really excited, Chad. But you know what? You could really use this at your day job. But think about it, Unreal Five. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's like now that we've delayed it again for an engine change. Which, you know, Unreal 4 to 5, it's not as hard as, like, say, like, switching engines completely, because a lot of it sort of more will convert over because it's, you know, the same engine, but that you more have just have to, like, you know, make sure that the tools are uh, compatible. Yeah. But, but, yeah, no, fuck, it's like, we, we can't do that. <laughs> you know, we're going to delay this game extra long to engine switch. By the way, buy our calendar. Oh man! Like, like but, fuck you guys. I think it's not for a little bit, like somewhere in around here that we get into the subject that I really want to ask about. So okay, but it applies back to like the stuff with the Unreal Five, and it's also going to apply back to like some of the stuff that we talked about with like the truck driving through mud and stuff like that. So what well, they did, but first there was the small case of a legal matter that almost killed the game before it even started. Just 21 days after the veiled attempt at shilling their app, and on January 24th, 2023, the Steam page for the day before vanished completely. It was there one minute, and simply gone the next, totally devoid of explanation. Immediately, people rushed to social media to speculate, some feeling vindicated that the fake game they'd called a scam for two years had finally vanished, that Steam had got wise and pulled it off the platform, or maybe that the developers had given up, while of course fans of the game believed it was a simple mistake that would soon be put right. Both of them were wrong. The situation got increasingly muddy when one of the previously discussed volunteers for Fantastic, a community moderator by the name of Wolf, took it upon himself to publish a statement on the official day before Discord, stating in essence that this was a simple mistake on Valve's end, that the Steam page had minor technical difficulties, and all would be resolved once the Steam maintenance concluded. This was not true, not a single word of it, yet another massive communication blunder. This one due to the reliance on unpaid and therefore uninformed community volunteers, as opposed to the trained professional who would have had access to a real press release during any time of crisis. Fantastic later went on to clarify that the disappearance of the Steam page was in fact a complex legal matter relating to their use of the trademark the day before. This trademark was already in use for multiple years by a South Korean citizen who used it on a calendar app. This individual had since filed copyright takedown requests with Steam to have the game blocked, believing that they were misusing his trademark in their product and seeking a legal resolution to the matter. Fantastic declared in their communication that they were only made aware of the situation on January 19th, days prior to Valve's compliance with the takedown requests. But upon inspection of publicly available legal records and documents, this was at best an oversight, perhaps a misrepresentation, or at worst an outright lie. This information was brought to light by Force Gaming, who discovered the trademark record showed that at the time of publishing the day before trailer in January of 2021, Fantastic had not even applied for the trademark. In fact, they never filed official paperwork until January of 2022, a whole year later. According to those same records, Fantastic was made aware of the conflict in November of 2022, meaning they knew their game name was likely to be a point of legal contention three months prior to the Steam page vanishing. Not just that, but anyone who has dealt with legal matters will no doubt know there is almost always a letter of intent or notice before any legal process is declared, making it unrealistic to assume Fantastic had only found out about the takedown notices being a threat merely days before they were actually sent to Valve and the Steam page removed. Even if that were the case, they would have known over two months earlier that their trademark was rejected due to their failure to dispute the South Koreans' own claim. Raising yet another question, how could they be so incompetent as to neglect a trademark for two years at every step of the way? Regardless of this, what became clear is that Fantastic's game is in a legal battle for their very name. The result was multiple of their YouTube videos being removed, the day before Steam page being removed, and months, potentially years of legal fees ahead of them before the name could be used again, if it ever could. The legal battle then began in Korea, where Mytona, the parent company, disputed the application of the calendar app's name in regard to an unrelated product such as a video game. Along with this came yet more bad news for the day before fans, another delay, this time moving the date from March 1st, 2023 to an even less certain date of November 2023. After all, no one can put a time frame on a civil legal matter, especially when it spans multiple continents and eight months seemed overly optimistic. All in all, the day before seemed to now be going to the stages of parody, stranger than fiction and impossible to make up. Every step of the way, if it could go wrong, it would, not due to unfortunate circumstance, but of their own making, essentially snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, managing to always place themselves in the right place at the right time, 
but being completely incapable of capitalizing on their chances. At this time, people were so jaded by the day before, expecting that everything they said or did was a lie, that this legal matter was even considered as a conspiracy. Some believed the copyright issue was simply a fabrication. When pointed out that there was real legal action being taken that would cost tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, the narrative shifted. A simple agreement between parties, expend money for a real legal battle, but both parties being on it from the start. Which raises the question, why did people think this was the case? And some truly believed it was to give Fantastic another perfect excuse to delay the game, one that no one could argue with as it was simply out of their hands as a matter of law. Possibly to even cancel the game and avoid launching and potentially being sued for real by the customers. Of course conspiracies are usually sexy, reality is often boring. This situation could simply be explained by Hanlon's razor, never attribute to malice, that which is adequately explained by stupidity, and Fantastic was to date defined by exactly that, stupidity. <laughs> This situation alone would have been crippling news for any company and their fans, but for Fantastic it was just another day, and also the beginning of much bigger issues. They released a new gameplay trailer on February 3rd, and this was seen as yet more vindication for those who accused the day before and Fantastic of theft. This time, it had real merit, unlike the previous accusations with the Division's art assets and more like the Last of Us logo. They had shot for shot copied the trailer from Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War Zombies. You can look at them side by side here, and you will see that this is an identical recreation. They wasn't simply using the trailer of somebody else, they were just recreating it with their own assets. Which again, is why people started to immediately take everything they'd done before and started to compare that to other games too, which showed that yes, this was really happening with a frequency that was impossible to ignore. And again, to be clear, it wasn't that they were literally taking assets from other companies, they were simply creating an exact replica for seemingly no reason at all besides being devoid of their own creativity. A situation that was inexplicable. After all, how could you know the internet is calling you a thief for stealing a logo for two years at this stage, and yet brazenly shot for shot copy another incredibly popular games trailer? They had to know, so to this day it remains beyond comprehension as to why they would do this. Were they purposefully creating controversy just to remain relevant? Maybe that's the answer, but what we do know is that they did it and never addressed why. Instead, they fought back against the critics, releasing a statement that still exists on their Twitter feed. We all live in a time of disinformation and lack of fact-checking. Anyone can say anything for views, and everyone will believe it. Disinformation needs to be dealt with, as it can harm not only us, but also other indie and small slash medium studios. It also has a mental impact on the members of such teams. After the release of the day before, we'll think about how to help novice developers deal with fakes and allocate resources for this. Destroying is easy, creating is difficult. A very powerful statement to be sure. One that clearly addresses YouTubers such as myself, who to this point, had only really given opinions on what had happened and speculating as to why it had happened. This statement could have aged very well if everyone had been wrong about the day before. The game could have released, and then they could have revisited their words here, pointing out how quickly the so-called hate mob jumped on their small studio, trying to destroy their beloved game. But you should return to this statement later to read it with the retrospect of what really happened instead. Until then, things continued to get worse. As Fantastic addressed disinformation from people they said would do anything for views, the next part of the story came from a place they would struggle to argue against, their own employees. On February 13th, a Russian publication posted an interview with insider sources at Fantastic. This interview discussed in detail the internal struggle of the studio, as well as the state of their flagship game the day before. And if you thought things were bad from the public perspective, well, things inside Fantastic were much, much worse. The source describes an incredibly toxic working environment, including mandatory crunch, referring to long work hours to try and meet deadlines, which led to a high turnover rate of staff, with people opting to simply leave the studio rather than continue in such a toxic environment. The article goes on to state, the conspiracy theory about the trademark issue was incorrect. There was no agreement. It was a real legal dispute. They also clarified it was just another sign of what they called incompetence of the top of Fantastic in all aspects, which makes total sense. People were assuming that the higher-ups of Fantastic were some kind of evil masterminds coming up with grand strategies when the truth was they were just really bad at managing their business. Which is, admittedly, much less sexy of a storyline. The article goes on to say that the brothers who oversaw the studio and often displayed in the videos of the day before were everything that is wrong with the development, that they are terrible to work with, shouting, screaming, cursing at employees, changing development decisions and direction on a whim almost daily. The studio was rotten at the very core, and these men were the ones responsible. They also go on to describe what many had speculated regarding early trailers of the day before, that they were simply vertical slices, and that most, if not all of the features on display, simply did not function in any real game. Just a hype trailer created in a small area designed to market the product. The interview ended, echoing the same sentiment that many of us have been sharing now for two years. I strongly do not recommend buying this. 
Now this is where my previous video on the day before ended. It was a deep dive on the whole saga, with months still left to launch, and with many questions that needed answers. Many of you will be aware of much of this story to this stage, but there has so much happened since then, and the story is so compelling, that I believe it needed to be available all in one place, with as much detail as possible. I truly believe this is one of the strangest video game development stories ever, and wanted to do it justice as such. And if you thought the ride until now was bumpy, well, buckle up, and I hope you didn't pick a window seat, because this is where it really goes off the rails. So some of the questions that were still being asked, even though everyone should have known better, will the game ever release? Was any of it real? Did they really do all of this for a kickstart on another game in a silly app? Are the investors really being scammed? And what's going to happen next? Well, very little, actually, at least for a few months. There were a few teaser images posted, nothing of substance. There was one video, which was their attempt to prove to the world everything was legit. That all the criticism and haters were wrong. Though all this video did was illustrate that at one time, they had a much more original, charming, and real-looking video game, before they decided to change it up and go for a hyper-realistic, almost Division 2 clone. Many considered the original models and art direction to be an upgrade on what it became, especially considering people had already put together comparison videos of the graphical downgrade of the day before from that initial trailer release in January 2021 until now. By this point in mid-2023, the game was almost unrecognisable, which, spoiler alert, is going to get much worse a little later in the story. On top of that, there was a very weird obsession from Fantastic with pictures of hot tubs and cars within the game. They posted multiple teasers of these, including a sports car driving through an alleged zombie-filled city. But in true the day before fashion, mysteriously, it was totally devoid of zombies, or players for that matter, yet again displaying footage that they spent time and money to create without any real purpose or result, except for confusing onlookers. Next came a quote from Fantastic Twitter. Okay, so that's one thing that stood out to me with all this stuff too is that that trailer is so drastically different from the initial gameplay trailer where it looks like there's like an actual full out like full on like a uh, breakdown of a city like there's no objects there's no obstacles in a way like how is it possible that you're running a lambo at full tilt through a city like that that's supposed to be this abandoned uh zombie ridden city like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Like, that's one of those things where it's, like, it it feels like that was marketing. Yeah, it know? has like, no purpose with anything marketing. you've seen up to this point. It, it, it reminds to me what somebody would make internally, right? Yeah. To show off, like, what, good, what driving physics we did. Yeah. This doesn't feel to me like something you would release to the public. This is, like, a proof of concept you take to, like, Mytona, not us. Yeah, I, I mean, it almost you know, it almost like, makes it feel like Need for Speed Zombies. Like, <laughs> that's what they were trying to do. It's like, yeah. a totally de it's totally detached and devoid of, like, what the game we've seen so far should be. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things, like, this is one of those weird things, you know, it, it sets off another red flag. Like, why do we need Lamborghinis? Yeah. You know, like, like I thought it was, like, did you find it? What do you do with it? Do you sell it? Do you take it back in with another run? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, because then if somebody kills you and takes it, that's really gonna suck. Yeah. Like, like, like it, it to me, like it's this weird sort of like, I don't it, understand. Well, there's no utilitarian to it. it, like for the yeah. for the environment. Yeah, that's something where I would expect more of like maybe like a armored Hummer. Yeah. Right. Maybe with a gun turret on top. Yeah. You yeah. Know, like like an LMG or something or, you know, but I don't know. Like it, it feels like, well, you get these very... almost like typically Mad Max esque looking vehicles with that kind of a game. Like yeah. that's cause that's what like practically would happen. Like God, I mean, even in fucking going back to your previous comment of like, uh, the walking dead, there's like, if you've watched the show in the first season, there's the whole scene where Glenn steals a fucking challenger and like, fuck yeah that'd be a blast and that's what it was was like in the moment it was a thrill thing and it was stupid otherwise because like the alarm was going off the entire time and everything <laughs> yeah well and, and, and to bring it back right like it's it, to me it just doesn't i don't know it it, it doesn't make sense to me there's no purpose unless, unless if i look at it from a different lens yeah Fortnite had yeah. sports cards in it yeah okay so, like, you know, is that one of those, like, 
hello, fellow kids, I heard you like fast cars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like that to me just is one of those, like, hello, fellow gamer moments. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We heard you like vehicles in your battle royale. Yeah. Because you like that Fortnite and that Warzone. But oh, we got some God. too now. Oh. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. Which appeared deceptively written or conveniently placed to appear as if it was a games journalist talking about the day before. The truth is that it was quoting themselves, saying, The day before will be at the top of Steam wish lists again soon. So, to take the temperature again, the day before was at this time considered by almost everyone to be a scam for one reason or another. There was nowhere you could go and see a mention of this game without that being the prevailing sentiment. You've heard and seen why people were feeling this way throughout, but as a reminder, one of the biggest criticisms was that no one had ever played the game or seen anyone really playing it. There was only incredibly curated trailers that felt totally off. This situation could very easily have been remedied by the developers if they cared. And to be clear, Fantastic owed the public nothing. No explanation, no apology, no gameplay, no access, and no game at the end of it all. After all, nobody had paid a cent. This would of course be against their interest as a business, since proving themselves real and the game good would have renewed a massive wave of hype for a game that clearly people were interested in, but they did owe them nothing. If they felt that they were wrongly accused, but happy to let the finished product speak for itself upon launch, they didn't even need to produce proof or let people see behind the curtain until it was ready. That would answer all the questions. But clearly Fantastic did want to prove themselves prior to that day, or at least they wanted to appear to do so. So they took to Discord to make a surprise announcement. This one could shut down the haters for good. A notification went out to the whole server, tens of thousands of users. The day before is coming to beta, and you can finally play it. The wait is almost over. You will see what we've made, and know that you were wrong for doubting. They also said that the test would give an opportunity for players to provide valuable feedback, which could improve the final product. This was a huge win for the people who still believed in the day before. A dwindling number of people, for sure, but one that could easily swell once again, especially if the developers were finally confident enough to put their game in the hands of a single living human. This announcement was not alone. They also parroted these talking points in a few interviews over the coming weeks with numerous press outlets. And to be clear, this was totally unprompted. Fantastic had gone out of their own way to announce and advertise this beta, raising the question, would they really be doing this if the game was fake or they wasn't ready? Not just that, but they also discussed plans for launch, which was getting dangerously close. Specifically plans for console launch, and whether the game would go into Steam's early access. Now to this point, across multiple years of communication and trailers, early access was never discussed, leading the public to believe the game would be a full release on day one. Which is why it wasn't surprising when the Fantastic employee being interviewed also confirmed that they quote, are not considering early access release. We are planning to conduct a closed beta phase prior to the game's launch. Why am I mentioning this? Well, remember those two points for a little later. They become incredibly relevant very soon. After this, things were mostly quiet as people waited for whatever disaster would come next. But for once in the history of the day before, this time it was good news. In late August, I published a video detailing my toner, Fantastic and the Day Before's victory in their Korean legal dispute. To cut a long and rather complicated story short, two legal cases existed. One in the United States that needs to happen to fight the DMCA that was issued to their Steam page, and one in Korea to address the trademark's origin. The United States case was on hold pending resolution of the Korean case, which had now concluded in favour of Fantastic. The Korean authorities stripped the original owner of their trademark as it relates to video games, effectively ending the dispute entirely. This would now allow for the United States case to dissolve in short order, as many countries have an agreement when it comes to upholding trademarks or copyright, so a win in Korea essentially means a win in every other jurisdiction in said agreement. Despite this victory, my toner and Fantastic had now filed a new trademark called Dayworld, which was clearly a placeholder name in case the United States situation didn't resolve in time for their impending launch in just over a month's time. Luckily, it was never needed. Unluckily, this victory was short-lived as things went right back to regularly scheduled programming just one month later. On October 30th, Fantastic began their marketing campaign for the day before's launch, which started with what they called the final trailer going live on November 1st. The timing made sense, since this was just nine days prior to when they'd scheduled the launch date. There was just one problem, however. Nine days until launch? Where was the beta that they promised? Regardless, people tuned in as the trailer launched and were unsurprised to see nothing really of substance that they hadn't seen for the last two years of coverage. Other than the fact that the game looked worse than each time before, there were still many questions, but at least it would all be answered soon. Not as soon as scheduled, as the trailer also delayed the game for another month until December 7th instead, the only other surprise was that suddenly, the game was now being advertised as launching not as a full product, instead as an early access title, something that came from nowhere. 
After all, if you follow the timeline, they believed this game was ready to launch eight months ago, and the trademark dispute was the only reason they delayed. But somehow, with nine months more development, it wasn't ready to launch without what is essentially an alpha tag and discounted price? Just another question that would go unanswered. Except for the obvious, the game was never ready, and early access could shield them from some criticism if things were not perfect. So this left another question to be asked. With the game now being a month away and having a perfect opportunity for a beta test, were they going to have one? But there was simply no mention of this. IGN fortunately was paying attention, and with a direct line to Fantastic, they asked the question, where was the beta? Fantastic's response would have been much better had they simply ignored the question entirely. Instead, they said that the beta was still happening, but that it was only for Fantastic volunteers. If you remember back, volunteers are what they call not only their full-time employees, but also the people who do their unpaid work such as moderation. So this was clearly a ridiculous thing to do and say, especially after they'd gone out of their way without prompt to quiet public criticism by promising this beta. They made no further attempt to clarify the situation, not with IGN and not publicly to their audience, who they told directly to expect the ability to play the beta, but also that they wanted them to play it to give them feedback and improve the game prior to launch. What this essentially means, reading between the lines, is that they valued secrecy of their game state more than they did any chance to make improvements to the product. That they were scared to show what they had, and that they were happy to pretend they never mentioned a beta to their fans, instead saying the only people who could play in this beta were people who already had access to the game, or were, according to my own experience, under non-disclosure agreements preventing them from sharing their experience. To be clear here, if nothing else had happened, if this video was one minute long, there was no additional context, this one decision from Fantastic would have given you everything you needed to suspect that this game launch was going to be a disaster, to declare that the development studio was rotten and that they were not to be trusted under any circumstance that this launch was going to be fireworks for all the wrong reasons. And that was true. Fast forward to December 4th, just three days before the big finale, and Fantastic again took to Twitter to reveal their truth. This letter was well received, much more than anything they had posted previously, and essentially just says they love their game, their community, and that they were here to update the game for the long future. In this letter, there are contradictions, such as them addressing people who criticise them, saying that they accept it which goes against what they said in a previous release earlier in the video that describes said criticism as disinformation and that people were not fact-checking. The message goes on to say some things that were interesting about the public perception, things that again become important later in the story. First, they asked people to not accuse them of scamming as they'd not taken a penny, which as I said earlier, was absolutely true. How could this game be a scam if they hadn't taken money? except for the leverage used to promote their other products, of course. But that isn't taking money for the day before from customers, so many would say that they were right. Second, they asked people to not call them an asset flip, which, to my knowledge, no one was really doing. At least yet. There had been accusations of stealing art from games like The Division and stealing style from other games as well as their logo and trailer shots, but not of being an asset flip which refers to buying pre-made assets off a store, making nothing yourself, and essentially just shuffling out a garbage product. This was a very weird inclusion for the game's pre-launch message, which- Okay, so this gets to my question. So, like, you've, you've got this, this accusation of asset flit flipping. Is it really as bad as they're making it out and as uh, Kira's making it out with this video? Like, is that, like, a game- killer for you guys like chat jim uh like i don't i don't know i i wouldn't think that like for especially for a small developer like buying assets would be that big of a deal it depends okay in this case yes okay because we saw how much it's one of those things where it's like another nail in the coffin okay like, if an indie game comes out and it's mostly assets, I don't really care too much about it. If the gameplay is good, if they say that it's an asset, like, if they're upfront about it, hey, I'm one guy working on this, I have no... I'm a programmer. I like games. I have no idea about art. Yeah, I'm so not I'm a UI developer. Assets. Yep. Yeah, I'm just doing this. If I get money... I might farm it out to some some private stuff. But as of right now, to give you guys a product I used assets, I'm down. Okay. But if you're kind of hand-waving it and being scummy and, like, the game isn't good and it doesn't look like it, you put a lot of effort into it and the design is bad and there's glitches and you have assets, yes. It, it's, like, one of those things where it's, like, it's like a symptom of the disease. 
Okay. Assets themselves aren't deal breakers for me. It's what is surrounding it, right? Okay. Like you have this game now that is published by Mytona, which is a fairly lo- fairly reasonably sized mobile game studio. You say you have all this money. You've shown, you know, these driving physics and all this other stuff, and you have Lamborghinis flying through the city, you know, so you show me all of this, and then you tell me that you didn't even make your own art assets. Okay. And you have a big team. That, to me, it's like one of those, like, red flags. If a guy that does a team of two or three, people in their basements, like, making making but fun using, stuff using the pre purchased assets is not like uh not like a thing i'm using that verbiage because necro said in chat and i was like okay that makes sense that buying assets isn't the same as an asset flip an asset flip is specifically uh just like you're you're literally doing the flipping of assets yeah like you're, so you're like taking an assets asset... and bring them another place and then selling them again yeah, if an asset flip, like, the best way to look at an asset flip is go on to Steam and look at games from, like, 0 to 20, and you'll you'll see games like, you know, Hentai Girl Kills Hitler. Okay. Right? <laughs> and it's like, you know, some bikini anime girl shooting Nazis. Okay. That's like an asset flip, right? It's like a low-quality game where you buy assets, you shove it in, and you put it on, on the storefront. Okay. You know, so it's so kind of like almost this... like, uh, oh, what's the RG, RG, RPG maker kind of stuff, too? Would, they, would you fall that, or would you qualify that under a kind of like the asset thing? Because it's like you're basically taking a full go- game development that's kind of like a plug and play. Like you're literally picking and choosing what you want out of a predetermined list of assets and things like that. But... I wouldn't because I view RPG Maker as like um sort of a game dev kit. Okay. Like a toolkit. Because like and maybe I'm biased because some of my favorite games like Symphony of War was made through, you know, a maker okay. thing. Um another game um called uh that I've been playing. It's a roguelike turn based, so imagine like early Final Fantasies okay. mixed in with a roguelike called like Time what let me see. Let me let me actually look it up quickly. Um, time Time Break Chronicles. Okay. You know that uses like RPG Maker. That I'm not concerned with <coughs> RPG Maker games because there's a lot of like I. In fact, I'm the total opposite. I love it because it allows people that have ideas in game design, but maybe don't know like have the technical ability. Engine. 10 learn that really wants to learn C sharp, but they have a damn good idea. It enables them to do it. Okay. So I'm more on the fence of like, in fact, RPG maker, I would say swings to the opposite where I would say that it's way more, um, beneficial for people without the tech know how, and it lets people get their ideas out and their creativity out. And, you know, I want to see this and I don't know anything about, like game design i don't want to learn programming but i got this really good idea Ooh, i can use this and it can teach me along the way and it's simplified it's more it makes game design more accessible okay so that's my opinion i'm sure other people might might think of it differently but okay but some of the best games i've played were from things like that like symphony of war time break chronicles because it's people that have like a really good idea and it enables them okay. whereas like the day before like you know you're telling me that you have this amazing game and mind you this is their words will be revolutionary but you can't even make it a tree <laughs> you can't even you know what i mean you can't yeah. even make a car you know that to me is like the red flag okay you're touting this like legendary revolutionary you're gonna change the genre and you can't even make your own assets you can't even make your own trailers yeah you know it's just like the another red flag i guess the other question i would have is like is it typical for like a a, a game of this caliber this quality to have a lot of pre-purchased assets and i guess that kind of feeds into a little bit to what you're just saying yeah um it's hard right okay you can like even say like call of duty has assets 
they use assets from their game, like you know, pri- pri- like proprietary assets that they flip in- yeah. internally, right? So it's hard to like say because it- it's just like it- it's to me, like I said, it's like the symptom of the disease, right? Yeah. Like it's it- it's like you're touting this revolutionary thing, but you can't make a tree. That to me is like what bothers me. Okay. Right. You know, so does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, no, like, no, it's, it's so it's not so like, much like it's not so much. This is like a a killer for any game. The It's not so much a uh, like the waiting for Unreal Engine. That wasn't a killer for the game. Uh, the asset uh, realization or purchasing of assets like that's not a killer of the game. It's kind of more the totality of everything for you guys. Yeah, and, and maybe it's the killer of this game because yeah. they're okay. saying about the scale of it. But if it's like you and me, we decide to make a game yeah, and we use assets, to me that's not bad because neither of us have art experience and stuff like that. Yeah. And a lot of the time, too, in early access, it's very common in early access to use placeholder assets like that okay. to get your product out. And that's one of those things where early access benefits you because you're still technically following the line. Think of it as like early access. This is a good way to uh, describe it as like Kira had spurned of this idea, a paid beta. Okay. So like, you know, you have a the game. The proof of concept but... is there. This maybe not the polished product. Yeah. Like I have enough money to finish the game, but Oh, a thousand people bought my game. I can now afford to freelance a tree and yeah. put in my own tree. I can afford to freelance this car so I can replace this random Jeep with one that's more unique to an in-universe maybe lore or company. Okay. So, you know, that that's kind of what I I would say about like that like on an asset wise like and it's it's the way you utilize them. If you use them as placeholders or if you can't afford it or you're like, you're new and it's like a small team of a few to use them to have a functional product. And then you over time switch it. That's fine. That's common. Hell, even triple a does that where they'll use like assets they've already made maybe from like other games that Just don't previous... fit the lore. Okay. Yeah. Like, like, you know, like maybe Assassin's Creed, which we'll talk about later might put a building from like Assassin's Creed two. And it's like, why is this European building in Japan? Yeah. Let's put in there so you can test the physics while the art asset guy is, is building the assets for are, it. are actually generating it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Necro is kind of saying that it is a little bit of an albatross for like indie game developers with using like purchased assets, especially like, so Necro said, no, it's not common for games from small studios, even on this level, to use store-bought assets to the level that it becomes an issue. Um, in fact, that most indie developers fear using them. So it kind of sounds like it is a little bit, it's got a little bit of an albatross to it. Well, it has that because of the asset flip games. Okay. Right? So, like, it, at first it wasn't. But then when you get these games that are, like... It's done again um, and again and again and again and again. You're seeing the same yeah. fucking assets no matter what. And, yeah, okay. I can get... I can see yeah. that. For, and there's yeah. no effort even into, like, reskinning it or something. Yeah, because it ruined the intent and the spirit of it. Because now if somebody sees an asset, you immediately think that's an asset flip. So it's sort of, like damage the reputation of using assets and that's why a lot of indie games are more afraid now to use it but the initial point was like to like enable indie creators to like get their product out switch it out you know yeah do stuff like that but because so many people have used assets like um kind of get you through day fry. one and then from there on you can patch it yeah yeah, like Big Fry goes over a lot of it. Big Fry TV, he was he, he's been mentioned in the video and stuff too, right? Yeah. Like he covers a lot of things like um Tanner. Tanner Rasem uh, I think his name is. Okay. Did like a lot of like social RP games. Okay. That based off of like um GTA RP that a lot of indie games came out with that. Okay. And those are like asset flips where you like 
you know, Tanner just grabbed a bunch of assets, shoved it in a world with poor physics, poor programming. I mean, like you could walk through walls. You, there was no map boundaries. So oh, you could wow. literally run, okay. off, run off the map, you know, stuff like that. That's an asset flip. Okay. And that's sort of what damaged the reputation from like a legitimate indie studio, maybe using it as a placeholder like it was intended. Okay. Overall read in a very strange way. Almost as if they were doing preemptive damage control, preparing for a storm that was. I'm gonna step away for just a second. I got a bossy dachshund. On the horizon, closing the windows and heading down into the basement to wait it out. The message ended and left people with mixed feelings. Many people's minds remained unchanged, expecting the game to be a complete disaster, with a small hope to be surprised. But since the game was about to launch, they were going to get a surprise and discover just how wrong they were. The day before was not a disaster. No, it was something much, much worse. It's map is lifeless, it's enemies are idiotic. I can't emphasize enough how bad the shooting feels in this game. And if you're gonna charge $40 for a game that plays this bad and has these kind of bugs and these kind of issues and this kind of server instability. It's PVP is an exploitable mess, it's story is pointless and it's progression is downright infuriating. Fuck the day before. It's bad, it's just outright bad. Oh yeah, that is the scam before. Close to three years of waiting, watching, and speculating had brought us all to this moment. Every single detail about this company was heavily documented. Every single aspect of the day before's development was heavily scrutinized. And yet, nothing could have prepared people for this launch. It almost defies belief that 10,000 words of this video script led up to the launch, and somehow, some way, the game was still worse than anyone expected. It wasn't just that the game was bad either. That would have been too easy. It was that Fantastic had clearly lied about what the game was, heavily misrepresenting what to expect from day one until the very moment you paid $30 and opened the game. Originally, and for every trailer, article, interview, description, or mention, the day before was an open-world zombie survival MMO. But what was delivered was an extraction-based shooter game just like Escape from Tarkov. A single, small map with a hub-based city with small server sizes of a few dozen players. On top of this, Almost every visually presented asset in the game was discovered to be assets purchased from the Unreal Engine marketplace, which on its own is not an indicator of anything, but in context. Okay, sorry. Uh, all right, so explain to me if somebody could, chat or Jim, what the fuck is an extraction-based shooter? Because I don't think I've ever played one in my life. Extraction-based shooters like Escape from Tarkov, Hunt and Showdown. You go in into a, like a large map. Uh huh. You get resources and then you try to leave. Oh, okay. With those resources, okay. and there's like a meta progression, um, like with Tarkov, like you have your traders and stuff like that. With hunt, you, like you you get hunting dollars, which you can buy better guns to take in to hunt. You know. Okay. Okay. Other, so it, it's basically like you know, um, big open world map. You know, you you go in, you get stuff, and you try to leave with it, and that's where like. I was saying about like remember earlier when I was mentioning like the full loot PVP. Okay. Yep. That's that's the hallmark of the extraction shooter. You you try to get stuff out, and then other people try to kill you and take your stuff while getting their own stuff while they scavenge themselves. So think of it like um kind of like kinda a captured like, a flag kind of situation. Or like a Hunger Games. Okay. Okay. You know, you, you go in, you try to get as much shit as you can, and then you try to get out before somebody kills you and takes it. Okay conjunction with the game's performance, design, and gameplay is often referred to as an asset flip. <coughs> a game that exists purely to try and make money from bashing together pre-purchased assets with little to no effort going in otherwise. And if we remember, just before release, they asked people not to accuse them of asset flipping, which nobody ever did. But now this is when the accusations began. And we'll not dwell on this too much, as this video is not a place to do a review of the game. I'll just say this. Even if the developers had not misrepresented what it was supposed to be, even if we all went in with full knowledge that this was an extraction shooter and not an open world MMO, it would have changed very little about the public reaction. It would have still received massive backlash for just how broken, unfun, and lacking in activities it was. There was next to no redeeming qualities at all, and the reviews reflected that, making it one of the worst rated games in Steam history. Not just because they lied or misrepresented, but because it was a bad game, full stop, no matter what the game was supposed to be. After all, if it released as an extraction game and it was good, it would have received criticism for what they did, but it would have still been played and lauded as a good game. But that wasn't the case. The game was just bad. Now, I do want to give some speculation as to why the game was so different to what they advertised it as originally. The games industry is not immune to the idea of writing checks that you can't cash. 
It is incredibly prevalent for game developers to overpromise right up until they come face to face with the reality that they cannot deliver what they originally said. There are people and studios famous for this very concept, such as Peter Molyneux and the Fable series. There needs to be no malevolence in this as a concept, because trying to do something and failing is not inherently a bad or evil thing to do. So I say that to say this, perhaps Fantastic aimed to be what they advertise, but at some point they realised they could not deliver. So instead, they stripped down on features and focused on a smaller version of an easier to create game. Taking the open world MMO concept and turning it instead to a simple map extraction shooter with smaller player capacity lobbies. This in and of itself would not have been a problem, nor would it have been reasonably considered bad if it had been communicated prior to release. After all, nobody had paid anything, nobody was owed anything. All they had to do was tell people what was going on. However, where this transforms from a perfectly reasonable, albeit disappointing circumstance and reality of game development, is when they decided to never mention this fact. Where it becomes what people refer to as a bait and switch, or would colloquially call a scam, is when they wait until they have your money before you find out that the game is not what they said it was, not even the same game genre. But if you thought that was the end, or that things could not get any more ridiculous, you'd be very, very wrong. What happened next was Fantastic saw the criticism and they responded the exact same way they had previously. If you remember back to when they were called out for promoting an app that they created during a video they presented as an insight to the day before's creation, they simply scrubbed the evidence away and pretended it never happened. When they removed the YouTube videos when people started to look up their shady history of abandoning games, they simply removed them. Remember, once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. This was the third time that they tried to simply erase the fact that they'd been caught doing something and called out publicly. Luckily, SteamDB.com shows updates to the Steam page, and they were caught red-handed removing tags that they lied about existing, such as massively multiplayer. And this wasn't the end of the threes, as another pattern was about to emerge just around the corner. So let's recap as things move very quickly from here. December 7th and 8th, the game launches. Within hours, reviews were some of the worst Steam had ever seen, with only review-bombed games like Overwatch 2 beating them out. And just to be clear, was this the worst game ever made? No, of course not. There's plenty of bad games, but most bad games usually never get to the front page of Steam, they never go all over YouTube, and they're never discussed by mainstream game publications. Usually bad games release, almost nobody plays them, and then they fade into obscurity, so it's rare to see such a large number of negative reviews on a game that is front and centre just like the day before. And also, to address the idea of review bombing, because some people, fans of the game, did believe that this was the case, that the day before was still good, and it was just a victim of yet more hate for no reason, you only have to look at the player numbers to prove that this wasn't the case. Player population was dropping like a rock, showing that people were trying it out and deciding that it was not worth sticking around. If the game was good, people would basically swallow almost anything to continue playing it, but not the day before. This game was basically speedrunning incredible popularity to death like almost nothing seen before. This is where things really should have ended, but instead, just like every other time people said that it could not get worse from here, it did. December 11th, just four days after launch, Steam removed the ability to purchase the day before, simply stripping the store page of the buy now button, something that is incredibly rare. The Steam page remained, much like a zombie itself, devoid of life. Is this actually as rare as he actually like portrays it to be here? Yes. Okay. Yes, because a lot of the times what they'll do is they will just pull the game entirely. Okay. Or they'll let it up for sale. Okay. This is one of those things where they almost leave it as a hallmark of like... Don't do this. At the time. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they removed the ability to buy it, but they also like left it up. So it sort of gets this hint of like, Steam doesn't trust the developer to sell their product, but they're not ready to pull it yet. Usually Steam is more like, oh, this is like, this is 100% a crypto miner, we're pulling it. This is, it, it's not rare that they leave it up and they're like debating it, right? Yeah. So it, it's really, really, um, it is actually really rare. Like, because it, it's, it's one of those things where it's like such a unique case because it's a bad game and they lied about it, but it's not malicious where there's no like crypto miner or anything yeah. in it like other games have tried pulling so it's a, it's this like weird gray zone that i think steam was navigating for the first time okay clearly things were not going well but considering the next piece of news that's actually an understatement so december 12th rolled around just five days after launch and screenshots started to circulate that showed one of the fantastic company founders discussing the game's finances in detail 
This showed an absurd, most likely an unprecedented refund rate for a game launched on the Steam platform, perhaps a game launched on any platform. The day before had sold an impressive day one 201,000 copies, with almost all of those units being on that launch evening within the first few hours. Proof that their strategy had worked until now, at least temporarily. Restricting access to any form of beta test had shrouded the project in enough mystery to sell six million dollars in copies of the game within a few hours. Something that would never have happened if a single YouTube video showing real gameplay footage had existed on the internet in the days prior to launch. On top of that, refunds as of December 10th when the screenshot was created were up to 91,694, a roughly 45% refund rate, which also misses data from the 11th and 12th, which undoubtedly would have included more refunds and little to no additional sales. This leaked screenshot also discusses the terrible review score, which was only propped up with 19% positive, as some people were using those positive reviews to post memes and stand out from the sea of red. It also discusses how much of a financial failure the game had become, while also declaring Prop Night, the game that they previously used the day before Popular did to promote, was also a financial failure. These leaks made it very clear that the day before was one of the worst games ever released on Steam, period. At least one that people noticed. And more people than ever were hopping on social media to declare that this game was an outright scam. After all, the original defense was that they had not taken any money, and therefore couldn't be a scam. But now, after launch, after the misrepresentation for multiple years, after now having taken people's money, what other defense could there be? Of course, there was one small detail that people were overlooking at this time, and that was that Fantastic, as of this moment, did not have a single penny of customer funds. Not a cent, not a ruble. Steam do not pay out developers immediately, so it was Valve that had the customer funds. And this was about to become a key factor in the day before saga. This is you funny. See, Steam's refund policy is rather strict, <laughs> stating you cannot refund a game beyond two hours of playtime, meaning there were potentially tens of thousands of users who were stuck with a broken game which was not even as advertised. After all, the game's server issues at launch were making it almost impossible to log on and play. The performance was so bad that some people were waiting to see if it got better with a few fixes, like many online games do in the days after launch. This would lead to many people being out of their two-hour refund window, perhaps without even getting into the game to play in the first place. It would be like buying a new television advertised as 65 inches, only to take it out of the box and realize it was 16 inches, then being told you cannot get a refund because you unboxed it. Where, without doing so, you wouldn't have personally been able to attest to the fact it wasn't as advertised, just like the players who didn't get to try the game wouldn't know either. This led to people, rightfully so, asking Valve to step in, especially when the next news hit Fantastic's Twitter. Now it's important to note here, personally, I was one of the biggest critics of Fantastic in the day before, but not even I could have expected this. Never in my years of covering or following the games industry had I ever seen anything like this. Just hours after the financial leaks began to circulate, it was all over, much faster than it started. Today we announced the closure of Fantastic Studio. Unfortunately, the day before has failed financially and we lack the funds to continue. All income received is being used to pay off debts to our partners. The message continued by the claim that Fantastic had taken no money during development of the day before, which was entirely irrelevant since they now had over 100,000 copies sold on a game that they had immediately, within five days, abandoned. If you thought this bonfire was already burning, with people calling them a scam all over the internet, now this was like pouring gasoline on that fire. Everybody was adamant that they'd stolen the money, that they planned this from the very beginning, that they'd just turn around and ran away as soon as that money had cleared. After all, how else could you explain what had happened? Who closes a video game studio five days after launching a game? After all, taking people's money, closing your studio immediately, and then saying you're going to use their money to pay debts, what other options are there? And realistically, everybody knows you don't wake up one day and realize you have no money. Clearly, the only reason the day before launched after over a year of delays was that this was the Hail Mary, that they were now out of money and they needed this launch. They were just out of opportunity to continue the charade. No more time to try and get the game into a better state. It was now or never. They knew this, and yet days before the release, they were saying, we're here for the long term. We're going to keep updating. A way to try and placate, to try and convince people to stick around, even if it was rough at the beginning. What other reason does this exist other than to try and make money? Clearly, if they didn't launch now, they would have gone bankrupt without ever launching. So instead of calling it quits, admitting the product was not fit for purpose, an actual disgrace to try and sell this to their fans, they just launched it for $30 per copy. And the charitable interpretation is to speculate that they were hoping they were wrong, that their own game was fun enough for some people to play and enjoy. But having done so myself, subjected myself to playing the day before, can't imagine who delusionally the company thought they would have anything beyond a tiny initial bump out of curiosity, followed by an immediate nosedive with refunds and accusations. After all, they had three years to prepare them for what the public was already saying, things that they knew the public thought about them in the game. 
Adding that they knew behind the scenes the final jigsaw piece was this, that left no doubt that this game was going to be a spectacular failure. So when faced with the decision, abandon and get nothing or release and ride off into the sunset with something, they decided that they were going to cash in. A decision that almost certainly would have resulted in legal action had this ended here. But this story isn't quite over. 12 minutes after the studio closure announcement, quote, this was our first big experience. Shit happens. So let's read oh my them real God. Quick, what they mean when they say <laughs> shit yeah, happens. Yeah, no, they're kind the of game misrepresented this is why over three years, the repeatedly moved the goalposts of launch, multiple times said they'd let people play the game and then never did, launched into early access for a high box price for a product that was not only utterly broken, but devoid of content or fun, and were now hand waving it away as if this is just something that happens to you, and not a long list of very intentional decisions that were made, leading us to this very moment. They were then even community noted during this Twitter thread when they claimed that the game was entirely their work. This note pointed to a Reddit thread that dissected just how much of the day before was pre-made store-bought assets. Which now brought this whole situation to a close. The only thing remaining was for the day before to make good on their promise to be a revolutionary game, to do things that no other game had done before. This came on December 12th, when Steam decided to remove the restrictions for refunds from the day before, essentially opening the ability to get a full refund no matter the circumstance. But it didn't even end there, as people continued to make very valid points that some users would not see these announcements, would not post even more refund requests if they were denied before, instead leaving Fantastic to escape with some of the customer funds, pointing out that even a single penny would be more than they deserved for what they had done with the day before. Luckily Steam saw this and agreed. They then took a measure that could be the first in their history, proactively refunding every single purchase of the game, even if it was not requested. Okay, so this is like, we're getting into like, this is actual uncharted territory here kind of thing. But Steam has never done this, where they have been like, you know what? We're issuing the refunds now. Oh. It's always been sort of like a consumer choice okay. of like, you know, you didn't like it. Or even if a game is bad, if you go over the two hours. By well, your own risk sucked. kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Caveat enter. This is the first time. This is the first time Steam has been like, no, this no. this is unacceptable. We are actually refunding the money because they broke the terms of service, and that put Steam in a very very bad spot. That if they didn't do anything, well, doesn't that wouldn't that also move um like legal burden to Steam? Because then Steam could actually yeah. go after them. <clears throat> yeah, and it would also yeah it, it, it's. Especially with them in their terms of service, right? With Steam's yeah. terms of service, where it, like you're not supposed to be using early access to fund, and then you have this company saying that we were using just that, people would have been able to go after Steam then. Yeah. Because it's like you're not following your own agreed upon contract that I have with you yeah. in your early access yeah. program. <clears throat> so it, it, that was like one of those things that was like I was I thought it was wild because it's like this has never been done before and because <laughs> you couldn't shut your mouth for 29 more days <laughs> wow you know at, because, at least like, fake it till you make it or like fake it like for a bit yeah like yeah, they they could have faked this and like none of this would have happened like done the oh we're working on patches and shit like that yeah, oh, yeah, we just had to let go of our staff. Oops, oopsie yeah. doodle. And and do you know? like the slow. Uh, oh God, what game recently came out that was kind of like that? There was one around the time of like Hell Divers, that was like a big like oh like this failed bad, and like the oh, studio when there was I remember that was like a more recent one like the studio went bankrupt like it was maybe a year ago that this shit happened and I was like wow like. And they just kind of slowly phased everything out. They kept saying, oh, no, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. We're not going to be able to fix it. <laughs> yeah. It's hard for me because being in, like, the Steam ecosystem for as long and being in early access, you say that, and, like, I'm just reminded of, like, 80% of early access. Oh, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... Like, I've fallen prey to some of it, you know what I mean? And it's one of the reasons I'm so hesitant on early access now. I really think, kind of, if if you want my, like, commentary on this, that Steam needs to really look at the early access program and, and sort of, like, maybe make prove, like, the developers prove, like, this is how much we have in our bank account. This is our financials. I know it's going to be a lot of work, but I think stuff like the day before on the scale it's never happened but it it does happen a lot 
with like you know oh we can't finish the game oh oopsie our, our budget is is done like um there was a crpg that i was really hyped for that this happened for that it was an early access um i think it was like the witch witchstone chronicles that yeah. was like really really like interesting it was a crpg you have these two major cities that were in a war and like as the player character you sort of leave to go to this unexplored land and you create your own nation and the entire concept was like what what do you do do you play arbiter do you conquer them and the entire thing is every single player every single npc was recruitable to be a, a party character so you could like get like the random homeless man and and you know the the trained soldier and have them in a party together like everything was playable and i thought that was interesting like all these characters having their own backstory and it was just one of those like overly ambitious like they couldn't do it so this is not uncommon but to this degree it's wow i'm looking really quick i almost want to say it was redfall you know that makes sense because um like it was like a triple A game and like was like hailed as like this big deal and I think like it resulted in like the studio like actually going under. Yeah, because I rem- yeah because um Microsoft shut down three studios after that. Yeah, that would make sense because they even shut down um the one studio in Japan that made Hi Fi Rush, which everybody was pissed at because Hi Fi Rush was actually legitimately good. Oh. And it it did a lot of damage. And that's when the conversation started happening around Game Pass, where is it damaging the quality of games because you don't really have quality control, right? Yeah. Because it's it's more of just get something out for the service because that was... um, Yeah. That studio is uh, not their bread and butter. I mean, they made Dishonored. Yeah, They made Prey. Like, they made some damn good games. And the reports from that were like, they didn't even want to make that game. That was a Bethesda thing. And then when Microsoft bought out Bethesda, they were hoping they were canceling it. And they were like, no, you're going to keep making this. Because they wanted it canceled, (laughs) but they were designing it, I think. And this is where I'm, my opinion on Bethesda has shifted. It was way Todd Howard's way of beefing up the value of it to sell to microsoft yeah okay i can see that because that was right around when fallout 76 got their their subscription plan they were working on that i think a lot of that um between that and like the elder scrolls online they were really trying to beef up their evaluation to really sell to microsoft okay basically wiping the stain of the day before from their platform once and for all, even giving up their own cut of money owed for the sales of the product. Making good on Fantastic's promise that the day before would make history, just in an unexpected way. With that, it seems that the story of the day before is over. Many people maintain their position that the day before is the biggest scam game ever created. A trailer that went viral, making it much bigger than it ever had any right to be. A developer that mismanaged every aspect of public relations, misleading them for years for a product that never truly existed. Showing trailers of a game that never materialized, baiting and switching with products to try and cash in on their reputation before delivering anything of substance, and then being caught provably lying on several occasions. Without a shadow of a doubt, the day before irreparably harmed the games industry, especially the trust that people place in indie game developers and early access as a vehicle for the delivery of games that are not quite ready but need that support. A model that has produced many fantastic games but has also been misused by people just like Fantastic. For what happened in the end, nobody got anything except for this story, one of the most ridiculous in gaming, until someone comes along and does something worse, if that's even possible. There are still questions that remain unanswered, ones that likely will remain that way. After all, every decision made in this epic saga could have been avoided. And I always go back and forth on whether things like this are actual scams, and which definition people are using when they say that word. In a legal sense that you could prove in court, I cannot say. But in the sense that we all understand as consumers, there is no doubt what the day before became. But the more interesting question is, what was it when it began? Because there is no argument to be made that Fantastic didn't intentionally mislead customers as a matter of habit that they made decisions to sweep issues under the rug, that they also cut their losses immediately at the end. If you were unfamiliar with the finer details, it might be easy to describe this as a studio getting more hype than they were ever ready or capable of handling, that their little game outgrew their abilities, that they just got in over their heads, which led to a hole being dug deeper and deeper as time went on, with no way to climb out before they reached six feet. 
but that narrative conveniently ignores that at every step of the way, this studio leveraged the attention that they received to try and profit, usually from misrepresentations, obfuscations, or outright lies. In the end, the comparison between what was shown and what was sold despite years of additional work makes the entire situation impossible to give the benefit of the doubt or a charitable interpretation. The release of the day before was missing almost every small feature that they painstakingly displayed during earlier trailers, leaving behind what many will go on to call the biggest scam in Steam's history. And that is the end of this story. Or at least, it should have been. But with these brothers in charge, it's possible that this story will one day be in need of another lengthy update, as despite the day before shutting down officially on the 22nd of January, a date that has no doubt passed by the time you see this video, and the studio officially shut down weeks prior to that, it seems that the brothers are not done. And if sources from seedaction.pl are to be trusted, they were never planning to be done in the first place. You see, according to multiple publications, even months prior to the official release and disaster of the day before, the brothers had already begun another video game development project. They were quietly gathering the most veteran of their studio to begin work on this other project, even some of the employees who were fired or quit due to the horrible working conditions under what many refer to as the most incompetent, clueless bosses in the games industry. Which means, for months, they were already planning their escape from underneath the weight of the day before and fantastic the studio that they likely knew the game was going to be such an incredible flop and were planning for that inevitability. With the financial well running dry and the game in such a terrible state, they made plans to move on before it had even run its course. Which, as a callback to the letter we read earlier claiming that those who spoke out were spreading disinformation, how they were planning to help other game developers and of course the later letter that promises future updates to the game for the long term, are yet more lies, designed as it seems to try and prop up as many sales as possible for a product they knew was insufficient and were planning to abandon just like every other project they'd released previously, proving that what they called disinformation was in fact accurate. Looking at the history of the studio and the brothers did lead to an accurate prediction of the future of this studio. On top of that, in a story that seemingly never ends, even when there should be nothing left to mismanage, the brothers refused to let it go, refused to take even the minimum responsibility for what became of their flagship and studio destroying game. January 24th, two days after the official closure of the day before and prop night servers, Fantastic took to Twitter in order to set the record straight once and for all. They claimed again that they didn't scam anyone because they returned all money raised from selling the game, even going so far as to point out how few companies would ever do the same. Neglecting, of course, how few companies would ever be in this position in the first place. The obvious <laughs> issue with this is that, as we pointed out in the video previously, Fantastic never had a penny of players' money to return. Instead, it was all held by Valve the entire time meaning it's not them who chose to return the funds, but Valve through the Steam platform. Now, whether or not Fantastic made this decision independently of Valve is something we can never know, but judging from their closure letter that came out on December 12th, stating they were going to use all the money raised to pay back debts, it does seem like their initial choice was to take the money, making whatever they say now contradictory and also impossible to look at with good faith. While everyone getting a refund is good, they are not to be applauded for eventually being forced into coming to the right decision only when the consequences of their actions became clear. When you have no real choice but to do the right thing, you don't get brownie points for doing it. And that's even if we assume you made the choice and not Valve on your behalf. The next part of the statement, they say they delivered on all aspects of the trailer in the final game, but go on to immediately contradict themselves with things that they'd left out, as well as ignoring the very clear video evidence on display that illustrates this point is completely false even on the face of it. But all of that pales in comparison to the end, where they essentially blame people such as myself, YouTubers and streamers, for making their game fail. Claiming that we made so many people hate the game by just telling them what was happening and what the company had done, that it was never going to succeed. Ignoring that games which are good will always strip users of their preconceived ideas and they'll choose to consume the product regardless of what came before, so long as the product is good enough to do so. Meaning if people chose not to play the day before, it was purely because the game wasn't good. And that ignores the objective data, with hundreds of thousands of users buying the game on release, of which over half of them refunded the game within a day, and the play numbers dropped to almost nothing within days of the game standing on its own two feet for the very first time. No amount of giving your opinion on whether or not a game will be good, or whether a game is good, or telling people what happened with a company prior to release, will stop people playing a good game. That's simply not how things work. Essentially, Fantastic refuse, even now, in the face of all the data, in the face of all the reviews, to acknowledge that they released a game that had zero redeeming qualities instead choosing to blame anyone and everything except for themselves. The funny part here is that in true fantastic fashion, this Twitter nonsense didn't just begin and end with silly, easy to disprove rhetoric. That would have been too straightforward. A few hours after this post was made, it had been community noted. This note called the game a scam and disproved the statements made regarding the features being complete from trailer to release with a video. This video comprehensively shows what was missing from the game that was shown previously in the trailers, proving beyond a doubt that even the basics of Fantastic's new claims were incorrect. 
Fantastic decided the best course of action to resolve the situation was to simply delete the Twitter post, removing that community note, and then wait a few hours and repost. Essentially hiding the oh evidence once more and trying to continue their PR spin without people calling them out. I'm not sure why they thought this would work, because the Twitter post was community noted again within a few hours, this time calling them out for deleting the post trying to avoid the note in the first place. Yeah. Essentially making yeah, it much worse, showing that they were trying to hide this, because the note was exactly the same, identical. Now clearly this wasn't going oh, the way Fantastic fucking... wanted, and they didn't like the idea of public consensus and evidence being present with their public statements. So they deleted the post again, then changed their Twitter bio to a bunch of red arrows pointing to a link, which sent you to their repurposed website. This website now hosts their statements in its entirety, only now devoid of the ability to be challenged by facts or public opinion. But just when I thought that this story was over, in what has become the fourth edit during production of the video, we finally got some answers as to what exactly happened for the day before to become known as the biggest scam in Steam's history. On February 1st, 2024, German game site and YouTube channels GameTube and GameStar posted a documentary featuring an extensive investigation into Fantastic, including interviews with dozens of former staff and volunteers from both Fantastic the developer and Mytona the publisher. The findings align with much of what was reported during the initial Russian language leaks discussed earlier in this video, but also answer some of the questions raised throughout the journey. PC Gamer also did a write-up in English based on this video, both will be linked in the video description. To begin with, all of the blame for what the day before became is firmly at the feet of the brothers. Game 2 sources point out that they were taken by whatever idea or trend they discovered on any given day or week, changing the direction of, design or implementation of almost every aspect of the day before on a whim. This wasn't even limited to just small areas or decisions, but entire art styles and systems. The examples given were the character creator which was overhauled every time the brothers played a new game, first with it needing to keep up with the GTA Online character creator, then Hogwarts Legacy, then Baldur's Gate 3. Whatever was trending, the brothers wanted their small game, their small team, to make it like that, or better. Next came the city that the players would be exploring. First it was supposed to fit the genre, a gritty, dark, realistic to the setting place, and then later to a brighter, almost cheery vibe like that of Spider-Man 2. And you can see this shift from earlier trailers to the final release. Of course, we all know the entire game changed because internally when they began developing the day before, it was supposed to be a small co-op game. Which is important context when you hear this next piece of information, the most insane and ridiculous part of this entire investigation was that it revealed the day before audience was not the only people shocked by the scope and scale of the game from an unknown developer. In fact, the developers themselves were more shocked than we were. According to this report, the day before developers, as in the people working for the brothers and making the video game, only learned that the game was supposed to be an MMO at the same time we did. As in, they were making the game, working with the brothers on a daily basis towards that goal, then the trailer released saying the game was an MMO, and the developers looked at each other like, wait, it's supposed to be an MMO? Which does answer the question, is it any wonder the game couldn't deliver on its promises when those promises weren't even discussed with the people making it? Next, the report moves on to another area the Russian article discussed prior to the game's release, and that is the treatment of employees. The details here are shockingly even worse. First, the brothers, who were based originally in Russia, hired almost exclusively young and inexperienced developers from former USSR countries. This might not seem like a big deal, since that's where they were located, but hold that thought. They then worked these people to the bone, forced crunch, unpaid, calling it voluntary work, which as we know, they like to use the term volunteer repeatedly, and this is potentially why. They were working people 16 hours a day, working weekends, no time off, no holidays, no free time. Then, at the drop of a hat, immediate and spontaneous terminations of employees for any reason, and maybe worst of all, they also had, allegedly, a policy of fining employees for their mistakes, meaning not only were they gobbling up young people at the start of their professional career, hooked in by their dream of a job in the industry, getting their foot in the door with what looked like a great opportunity, but they were exploiting these people in every possible way, most of which are illegal almost everywhere on the planet. So they knew they had the only carrot in town, that these young and aspiring employees had nowhere else to turn if they wanted to make their way into the industry, and so they had an infinite source of employees to exploit, and exploit they allegedly did. The example given in the investigation from Game 2 was employees forcibly fined $1,930 for poor quality voice recordings. So these people were inexperienced, underpaid, overworked, and fined by bosses who sabotaged their own product with their delusions and flights of fancy, with the employees being the ones to pay the price, literally. Not only this, but Game 2 in their interviews with dozens of former employees discuss what other publications have alleged during their own investigations. 
the brothers are not finished. Just before the game went live, they vanished, likely because they knew what was going to happen to the game. They only actually resurfaced on Microsoft Teams to close the studio and of course write nonsense on social media weeks or months after. The closure of the studio was so abrupt, and of course them appearing out of nowhere after being missing for days, led many former employees to believe- So one thing I had thought of in all of this, and I, I kind of wanted to see your opinion on this and Chad's opinion on this too, is do you think one of the brothers did this because they felt guilty? Like they couldn't just walk away. They felt at least some guilt to where they had to defend their product and at least let people know like hey no it's closed stop showing up for work no i just think they're just disgusting labor farmers okay <laughs> I, I think i think i think this is they wanted a bag and like you could tell um i would have maybe agreed with you if the totality of everything okay but the constant delaying the baiting switching prop night you know, this game, that game getting abandoned, like, like, yeah, maybe I would have believed it initially, but like every single action going back to their, the abandonment of per, poor performing products, the fact that they've taken advantage of like, basically labor farmed their entire thing and then wanted to walk away. I just think they were stupid and arrogant enough that they got away with it with their past things that they upped the scale with the day before and they like spoke too soon and Steam said hell no. Okay. That's my opinion at least though. Believe that the closure was probably planned. And of course many rumors that Game 2 have also heard that behind the scenes these brothers are allegedly working at a new studio on new games. They are going to return, most likely pulling the same tricks and stunts as documented in this video. Which brings us to hopefully the end. But here's the conclusion. What did we learn? Was the day before a scam? That's going to depend on who you ask and what definition you use. Was it a financial fraud from the beginning designed to make money from nothing? No. Clearly the intent at the beginning was to develop a game and make millions of dollars. After all, the brothers had been making games now for close to a decade, trying to scale up from each project into something bigger and bigger and better each time. From day one to the final day, the intent was clearly to distribute a product that would make money. The more, the better. So this wasn't a malicious or malevolent way to try and steal money for something that was never going to exist. And if that was the only factor that mattered, it would be clear cut to say the day before was just a failed product with no allegations of impropriety or malevolence having any merit. But that isn't the only factor, is it? The decisions made and the steps taken from the minute the public learned of the day before until the closure of the studio and now beyond indicate that there is a much more complex answer to the question of if it was a scam or not. So facts on the table, the brothers made the decision to show footage of things that didn't exist, that may never exist. They made the decision to bait the press with media releases, to scale up the game while being unable to likely deliver, to lie about the beta testing, to never mention early access, to launch the game with years of deceptive marketing as a totally different and grander project, to launch the completely broken game, and to say they were going to keep the money after merely five days of launch for an unfinished product, as well as many other decisions along the way. Whether they knew at every step of the way that they were contributing to a massive train wreck isn't something I can answer, but it's one that I don't need to. We only have to look I at do feel like there was a point that they had to have reached out to where they, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, and, and the thing is, the reason I would say it's a scam is not that, you know, feature creep or any of the other thing. I think it's the way they've handled their past software with the the abandonment. And then you have the, the Ken Levine, I got a new idea, you know, but yeah. without having the talent of Ken Levine, you know, and, and stuff like that. And especially then taking money from your, your excited player base. Yeah. You know, I think there's a point of like where you cross the Rubicon. I think when that moment was when they went into early access, I think that it, they were incredibly scummy at first especially given their past actions of flipping okay. their um, their games of like, we made this game, oh, nope, now we're going to abandon it. Now we made this other game, look over here. Like, yeah. it, 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 <clears throat> I, I think that is if you bad were games on PC. But when they pulled it with the day before, and I think that's when they did it, in my opinion.